things which, which were scheduled with the Northwest in respect of curriculum were cancelled. And some of the meetings which required monitoring towards the end of the financial year, we couldn't really fulfill those meetings because they coincided with the lockdown. So those are the main reasons, Chair. We can move quickly to the next slide. We're just providing details in terms of those targets that I've spoken to, which we could not meet. The next slide. And uh, again, uh, and here yeah, we particularly focusing on infrastructure, a CD and the safe program, and we are giving these reasons that I've just given now. Next slide. Uh, yes, next slide. Is this still the same information? Then we're getting into the financial performance as at the end of the fourth quarter of uh, the financial year. And we are simply saying we allocated 24.4 billion um, as a department and 82% of uh, that, uh, which is uh, 20.1 billion um, is allocated to transfer payments as indicated below, Chair. Next slide. We, the breakdown continues of the 82%. Next slide. Uh, that's more detail in terms of the same information that we just referred to. Next slide. Uh, and we break in this into actual expenditure. As the uh, chair would appreciate and uh, honorable members, we've been able to spend uh, 23.7 billion out of 24.4, which leaves us with uh, a difference of uh, 700 million which takes us to 97% uh, in terms of the overall expenditure. We can move to the next slide. And we're just giving uh, challenges um, and uh, uh, mitigatory measures and progress that we have made in dealing with uh, some of the challenges referred to. Next slide. Uh, the same thing, we're providing reasons there and it's infrastructure. Uh, in most cases, national assessment a little bit. Next slide. And we're just providing expenditure in terms of economic classification chair. Uh, expenditure remaining the same, 97%. And we're giving the breakdown there in terms of economic classification. Next slide. And we're then giving challenges and reasons. And uh, that's the information that's provided there. The next slide. The same in this slide. Next one. And then we get into the main core of the presentation, adjusted budget uh, as indicated earlier on. We can move to the next slide. And we're just indicating how the budget has been adjusted. Yes, you can see uh, that uh, essentially all the way uh, there has been uh, budget cuts in all the five programs of the department. The reason being that uh, we needed to contribute to the 500 billion stimulus package that was announced by the president. In fact, National Treasury was looking for something much more, uh, up to even 10 billion and so, and we could only um, uh, go to the amount that is indicated here that uh, we lost overall um, a 2 billion, as we can see there, in terms of the adjusted budget, um, and we indicating, of course, the variance on the extreme column. The next slide. And we're just indicating uh, reasons, uh, um, of course, because of COVID-19, face-to-face and face-to-face uh, -face monitoring, Activities that involve face-to-face -face have been drastically reduced almost to zero, and that's where we had to identify savings from. We also looked at the reduction of some of the uh, projects, such as metric second chance, savings in the workbooks, uh, areas of catering, venue facilities, and so on, because we're doing virtual, me I mean, virtual meetings most of the time. And uh, the next one is it just shows economic classification there, Chair. And we're providing details of the cuts 
And what we see under payment of capital assets, um, it's essentially 550, 540 million rather, which was going to be used for emergency sanitation and water. The 60 million was going to be added to that to make it uh, 600 million from the line budget uh, provided in, uh, in infrastructure to make it 600 uh, million. Uh, and I'll talk to that a little later in the presentation. We can move. Next slide. And we're just giving uh, reasons of or explanation in terms of where we, we were able to get the money and so on, which I've explained already. 71 million from workbooks, which was identified as savings, would still be able to provide workbooks to, to learners. They won't be without workbooks. Next slide. Uh, that does the second chance program. We can continue. Uh, earmarked funds, we, we also indicating there where the cut happened, uh, National School Nutrition Program, the metric second chance program, I've indicated about that, the workbooks. And I've also explained the issue of uh, school infrastructure backlog, taking that 540 million uh, from over and above uh, the other amount that uh, National Treasury used for a contribution of basic education towards uh, the, the, the 500 billion stimulus package, uh, which was announced by the president. Next slide. Uh, we, we're providing an explanation in terms of transfers and subsidies, uh, uh, which we have explained earlier on, payments of capital assets, We've also explained taking uh, money from a uh, school backlog infrastructure grant, which should be used uh, for infrastructure rollout, building of schools and so on. That's the effect of this. The biggest uh, impact of these cuts is in infrastructure, which means that uh, many of the projects that were supposed to roll out in this financial year will have to be kept on hold. And if we continue this way, we might not be able to roll out uh, 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 infrastructure projects like we did previously. Next slide. Uh, conditional grants, we, we indicating there that uh, uh, no grant was spared. All of them um, had to go through the cut and overall they contributed the 2.3 uh, billion that we see there. Um, and we indicating the final budget in the extreme column. Next slide. And we're just providing the explanation in terms of details of the cuts in each of those grants. Uh, that's the explanation that's provided. Next slide. And we also indicating other transfers. We took money from one of our entities the uh, South African Council of Educators, they, they would be able to continue or with their business without uh, the 4.7 million that we have taken from them as part of uh, contributing to the cuts. Next slide. Uh, we show in the impact of some of this in the programs, we say in the national assessment and public exams, a reduction of the budget for uh, the national assessment, we're providing the, the explanation in terms of the impact of that, but we believe that uh, we'd still be able to ensure that these activities continue and our young people are still able to sit for exams. Next slide. Uh, we're providing more details in terms of the exam specific areas uh, that we are focusing on to modernize our national and public exam systems so that it's in keeping with the current developments that we find ourselves in. Deployment of ICT in our business processes to help us do things much faster and much uh, smarter. Next slide. In terms of curriculum, um, we providing the explanation there, uh, which I have spoken to already. We can move to the next slide where money is coming from, face-to-face -face is not going to happen that much any longer. We're deploying uh, resources on ICT to monitor 
and to carry out some of our activities through ICT, which is the explanation that we are providing even on this slide, uh, slide number 39. Next slide. Uh, we're looking at social cohesion and we're also indicating impact there and how we're mitigating uh, the impact of all of this. We've provided an explanation there as well. We can move to the next slide. To monitor and to carry National out some School of Nutrition our Program through ICT, um, which is the uh, explanation we that you are providing. Here that we had to change a lot slide, of things with COVID 19. Uh, food experts uh, are to be trained. Uh, they have to be provided with COVID essentials such as masks, in gloves, impact and there, other things to be able to ensure safety uh, and uh, all of health measures and social distances. We provided an explanation scheme as well. Continues. Next slide. Uh, to monitor and to National School Nutrition Program. Uh, uh, well, we're indicating how we have reallocated funds within the grant uh, to address some of the things that I've just uh, spoken to now. We can move to the next slide. And we're just indicating how feeding has been happening. We're also providing food parcels. We're providing feeding to children who are still at home and providing feeding to those who are at school um, um, uh, attending. Next slide. And then we deal with uh, infrastructure. Just in and, how uh, has been we providing details in terms of where the money has and gone, which has been taken from the education infrastructure uh, grant. It was used to buy uh, COVID essentials, uh, chair, the masks Next for learners, slide. for teachers, the sanitizers, and then all the COVID the, essentials, just, you know, we had to use this the, money that is allocated to this grant uh, and then keep on the whole project that was supposed to be rolled out where and use the money, money for, 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 for COVID from, essentials. Uh, the infrastructure uh, grant. Next slide. Used to buy and we provide uh, more essentials. Uh, uh, talking uh, about water and sanitation and we we'll cover that in a while. Next slide. We just providing a breakdown on the whole the project that the province roll out in terms of the EIC, but the cuts in the province are much bigger than what we are showing here. Next slide. Look at uh, what has happened and we provide it here. We only show it what comes from the grant here. The next slide. In a while. Next slide. Uh, emergency water supply uh, and sanitation. Uh, we had to respond to 3,157 schools for provision of water, which is not a water at all, and to 1,428 schools which is not a sanitation. We provided portable uh, sanitation uh, to schools that had peak latrines. We provided them with the chemical uh, portable sanitation units. Uh, some people are not happy about them. They call them glorified uh, uh, pit latrines, uh, but what, that's what you can provide on the spot. Others will take a little longer, including uh, alternative uh, technology that we could deploy that. in providing uh, uh, sanitation. Uh, Next slide. Uh, but what, that's what you can provide on the We're just indicating where the schools are located. Next slide. And then this is evidence of the work that we have done, Chair. The small tanks that was on social media and so on, which are intensely green, are Long not our tanks, the, these are our tanks, the, and, the, and we the, use the, the red water as an implementing agent to do uh, this work, phase one. Next slide. And we yeah. are looking forward to provinces taking over phase two, which will, which will now be the permanent slide. installation of this temporary installation. And then, this Next slide. Of the work that we We're just done. providing yeah. progress. We meet every day, chair, six o'clock in the morning, so on, to monitor yeah, progress in this regard. No, and no, we've been assured by provinces that there is no school that has not reopened because of water and sanitation. Schools that didn't have this, all of them have been provided. This we are only topping up as we speak. Next slide. 
the slide. And here we just highlight some of the challenges as we are on our way to deliver water to schools. We get stopped, our tankers get stopped by communities of the You can't go and provide water to schools when you don't have water. And we want to use this water, and you'll have to go back and get water for schools. And the challenge is that the money that we have set aside is only for schools and not for communities. And some of the communities even use water that is uh, provided to schools. And some of the water tanks get stolen. Some of them get taken away. And uh, we also face the challenges of local business people, and particularly in KZN and Eastern Cape. And Limpopo is the communities that are saying, we don't have water, you can't pass here. You have to provide us with water before you move on. Some of them, we highlight Next slide. Provided to schools. And this one is to bring a permanent solution. We met with Kokta, Lisa, and Salga to put a permanent solution to this jet municipalities to take over this responsibility. And I must just highlight that many municipalities have not recovered from the recent drought, and many of them are in battle to provide water to communities and schools. Next slide. Next slide. And this is just uh, to indicate uh, uh, the sanitation uh, portable units that have been provided. Uh, next slide. And as I said, some of them are rejected by schools and communities because they view this as funeral trials, as many of them call them and glorify trees which are used in funerals and so on. Some schools have been rejected. Next slide. Yes, we've covered this one, long-term solution. And as I said, some of them are rejected by them. In terms of broad value, this is a funeral of our empowerment. Our procurement has a glorified a deal with this chair, but at the moment we are able to provide you with the next figures. And I hope in the future we'll be able to eliminate what we are saying here into specific figures so that we are able to see that from these transactions, um, uh, uh, transactions of what value went to advancing broad-based uh, black economic empowerment. Next slide. Uh, we're providing some figures here, and as I said, that in the future uh, will provide even much more uh, detailed uh, information in this regard, and this is what we're able to uh, put in for this presentation. But I'm sure that uh, next time we'll be able to present something much more substantial than what we presented now. Next slide. That's the end of the presentation, Chair. Thank you very much. I hope I've been able to give you your time. And this is under extreme pressure, but uh, thank you for this presentation. But I'm sure that uh, next time uh, thank, thank you so much. Uh, uh, yes, you are right on, 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 on time. Um, we, we are going to play. Let me check. Is, is, is the minister in? That's the end of the presentation chair, thank you very much. I hope I'm no, yes, I am. 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 Yes, I am.
Joseph. I think that's 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 it. Um, <clears throat> all members, we let's 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 try three minutes, please. Uh, let's start with Honorable Lenzana. Sure. Let me try this three minutes, Chairperson. I will try to run very fast. Let me start by appreciating uh, this presentation from uh, the DG. And fortunately, DG has been uh, for some time within the Eastern Cape environment. So at least some of the things that I would be asking, he is actually at least, you know, uh, known to him. Let me start with decentralization, uh, Honorable Minister. Uh, the centralization or decentralization of your procurement systems within the department. Uh, how, how, how is the centralization of the department in terms of procurement? Is everything done, you know, in one space or there is an element of decentralization? And what are the effects of such? I'm talking to, for instance, the delay of the implementation of the COVID program because of the contractors paying back some people because they say, they were not involved as part of the province. The second one is on, on, on the vacant posts, Honorable Minister. Uh, what is the percentage of the vacant posts? And uh, if we could be told as a committee, uh, what are the reasons of not filling these funded budgeted for uh, a vacant posts? I'm trying to rush Chairperson. On the cut of the school backlogs infrastructure grant, this one worries me. A <clears throat> Minister, you have got schools which are operating in the same site. I wonder if you know how many are such. Uh, in your Alfred and Zoho, I do have a list, for instance, of a particular district which I visited. And one now would like to know the effects of such, like how many COVID cases do we have in such schools? Uh, I'm trying to rush the person. Uh, I'm not sure how much time do I have now. I will let uh, you know. let, on maybe let, let, let me go for the last one. Uh, how much is the involvement of the SGP in your what I have termed as that old teacher, the old school development, uh, like the tanks which are turned back because <clears throat> uh, of the suitability, the toilets which sent back because of the suitability. Minister, there is a particular school where the SGB is querying the fact that the whole school is dilapidated, but the department decided to put in two million rands worth toilets in a dilapidated school. Uh, now, the, the children are enjoying to be more in toilets than being in the classrooms. It disjointed because the SGB was not involved. Chairperson, I'm trying to rush. I will come back if I do have a bite. Uh, take, thank take, you so take, much. Take one, take one, uh, quickly. Uh, the, the last one, the last one, Chair, would be uh, on, on this question of uh, controlling uh, children going back to school and teachers. If, if, if the minister could take us into confidence, particularly in relation to the budgeted funds for uh, nutrition, what, what is happening with nutrition as children are now not going to school and all that? Thanks, Chairperson. Thank you. Honorable Sarupen. Uh, thank you very much, Chairperson. Chair, I've got a couple of questions. The first is to do with the um, costs of PPE and schooling and whether or not the National Department has been benchmarking the cost that provincial departments are procuring PPE at to ensure value for money and making sure that there aren't undue cost escalations or, or profiteering at the expense of our children. Um, my second question is with regards to the recent court ruling on the National School Nutrition Program, um, where the court ruled that, the, that it has to be rolled out across the country, um, I note that there's been a one, billion, a 1 million reduction I think in slide 27 of the of the presentation, I'd like to know if this project is still fully funded in light of the cuts and if they will be able to comply with the court ruling. Um, and then my third question, Chair, is with regards to the reduction 
in the education infrastructure grants. Um, what are the critical projects that are affected by this? Which schools are affected in which provinces? Thank you, Chair. Thank, thank you, uh, Honorable Matafa. Thank you very much, Chair. Greetings to the Minister and uh, DM, uh, DG and team, and all honorable members. Um, Chair, I, I just have a few uh, honorable Lanzana, <coughs> excuse me, uh, have taken away the issue of centralization of uh, procurement. I just would like to maybe add some more weight to the question in terms of those contractors that are being turned away from local communities. I think in some instances, Chair, there is a fair request by locals to participate in the mainstream economy. And sometimes the procurement uh, being centralized does not allow for that particular need to be translated into a reality. Now, my question would be, is the, is the policies that are related to procurement friendly enough to allow locals to be able to participate? Because I think for me, policy interventions can allow contractors to ensure that locals are taken on board when projects are being launched. The second one, Chair, is uh, related to slide 16 and slide 22. The DG is correct to say the most impact that will be suffered is on the infrastructure by moving of funds. I just need clarity. There are two line items on expenditure. One speaks about planning and the fee on the slide 16 is 1.9. I think it's 1.9 billion. And the other one is policy. 1.3 spend. I'm interested to find out the itemized items that are contained in those areas. And what drew my attention, Chair, is that under the line item planning, there's an element of assessment. And again, under the line item policy, there is an element of monitoring. So my question would be, are there any non-fixed costs or fixed expenditure here that can be saved during this period of COVID and those expenditures be moved to infrastructure because we are grappling with the issue of uh, infrastructure backlog and having planning and assessment that might not necessarily be implemented at this point in time and then we save infrastructure. For me, it's something that will uh, definitely make sense. The, the last one, Chair, uh, I'm hoping that uh, the DG will tell me that they would have seen this one. It's a, it's a media article. I just want to confirmation if whether it's true, and if it is true, what is the view of the department? Uh, I came across an article where it states that the education department in the Eastern Cape will spend 400 million leasing 55,000 tablets for grade 12 students. Now, for me, it's, it's interesting to find out if whether has this been done within the needs assessment of the province to say that 400 million is worth spending on items, considering the glaring backlog on infrastructure and other items that we see on a regular basis in the media and in uh, discussion groups, where some schools in the Eastern Cape still use peat latrines where some schools in the Eastern Cape, like Honorable Mlenzana is saying, are dilapidated to a point that they are in, inhabitable. And for us, this kind of issues would require clarity so that when these issues are being raised by our constituencies, we are able to respond to them. So I need confirmation and the view of the department. But uh, I think the DG has skimmed very well through the presentation. As much as we are surrounding, we're able to pick up uh, the most salient points. Thank you very much. Eh? I appreciate it. Thank you, Honorable Peters. Thank you very much, Chairperson. And I would like to join colleagues in appreciating the attendance of the Minister and Deputy Minister, as well as the presentation by the DG and, and, and team. Uh, I think the Honorable uh, Members have raised some of the questions, but I, I would want to emphasize the one related to Minister, the deplorable conditions under which children in the rural areas in particular actually go to school. You would remember, Honorable Minister, last year around exam time indications of learners 
in the Eastern Cape and KZN who had to write exams in the sun, primarily because the school class, uh, the, 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 the school infrastructure did not allow for that. I know, Honorable Minister, the ACIDI program has delivered quite a number of schools throughout the country, but I would believe that uh, 25 years down uh, at the line, we cannot uh, justify the, the situation that is really prevailing. It is dehumanizing, Minister, uh, the, the type of schools and ablution facilities in particular. The president uh, committed to eradicating the pit latrines, especially in view of the challenges related to those children who fell into the pit latrines in the Eastern Cape and Limpopo. So I would believe that as a department at DG, that you, you should be the key priority. But I don't think that it would be proper for us to go for the Rolls Royce of toilets when children don't even have classrooms. I think we need to look at how the COVID-19 has actually put bare the fault lines that despite the, the, the delivery a, 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 a record, the department still has got big challenges. And I would want to, 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 to actually uh, uh, advise uh, Chaperson, the, the DG, as well as the ministry, that I think we need to get uh, the police involved in this contract hijackers. Because there are contract hijackers in the in KZN who demand from contractors who have got uh, the contracts uh, 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 properly to give them 30%. But also those who don't apply or tender when the, the tendering process unfolds, but wait for the allocation and disrupt the process. Because they are actually disrupting the delivery process for the, 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 the school's infrastructure, especially in our rural communities. Uh, this is actually a, a sabotage by these contractors. And I would want to believe that this is a matter for the police. But also, um, Minister, what has been your engagement with the Department of uh, Communications with regard to rolling out the infrastructure uh, or network infrastructure? In particular, if you are going to be giving laptops or, 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 or equipment to learners, they need to have access to internet. They need to have uh, access to some kind of connectivity. And I know that most of our communities in the rural areas are unable to do homeschooling and linking up with uh, 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 the classrooms, especially now with the impact of COVID, especially on those classes that have not gone back to school as yet. DG, uh, with regard to the feeling of posts, how long and how many posts have been vacant in the Department of Basic Education? It is actually uh, disheartening to know that there are quite a number of some of the qualified educators, but also qualified uh, 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 um, graduates who are unemployed as we speak, and yet the department could be having uh, uh, um, vacancies. And, and, and I want to say, Chairperson, that the DG should not talk about saving from unfilled uh, positions. Parliament appropriates monies for different programs, including filling of these posts. And we cannot justify not advertising and filling the posts and calling that money a saving. It is underspending and it is wrong for us to underspent in this difficult economic conditions where people are sitting, especially young people who are graduates are sitting un uh, unemployed. But also, Chairperson, I would want to find out uh, from the DG, how many of the small businesses in the country have been affected adversely by your department's failure to pay them within the, the stipulated period? There are small businesses that have gone bankrupt primarily because of not being paid on time. Some of those are actually related to school infrastructure who actually claim that they left the schools incomplete primarily because they were not paid 
and they rely on these payments to be able to continue doing the, 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 the work. The, the, with regard to the National School Nutrition Program, a, a chairperson, apologies. I want to know from the department, is the department giving the, the food handlers and, and uh, those mothers the requisite training on how to handle food so that it becomes nutritional, but also how to enhance hygiene? in the environment in which they are cooking for these children. We have seen during this COVID-19 a, a videos doing rounds that shows, including being shown by teachers, that this is where the, 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 the children's food is being cooked. I would want to know also, Honorable TG, why are some of the principals defining themselves out of your management, a, a, a department of basic education, Cold face service delivery management responsible uh, 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 agents or managers. Because it is important that they actually uh, see themselves as part of this. Chairperson, lastly, the quality of the PPEs and the quality of the sanitizers, they are indicators, equally so, again, shown by teachers that some of the sanitizers is just water. Whilst we know that in some of the schools, children are playing with the sanitizers, but we also want to say, DG and Minister, those service providers who gave us this watery uh, uh, sanitizers must really be blacklisted. We cannot continue with business people who really want to make a quick buck at the expense of the lives of our educators, the life of our staff, as well as the life of our learners. Thank you very much, and apologies again. Chairperson and, and members. Thank you, Honorable Peters, Honorable Kaiso. Thank you very much, Chair, and I want to welcome the presentation made. Uh, well, I, I, I'm not going to repeat what my colleagues have said already, but I must make an emphasis on this one, uh, Honorable Chair. The issue of infrastructure, uh, we do not have any excuse about it. And uh, I don't understand how uh, the department would uh, say there is a infrastructure backlog, uh, and at the same time there's this uh, demobilization of uh, resources for infrastructure development uh, in the schools. It, it doesn't make sense for me. More so that the president has made a number of emphasis on the issue of in. Uh, infrastructure development uh, uh, towards the growth of the economy. It doesn't make a sense to me. So if it was according, according to me, I would not allow it. Uh, in fact, it, it, it says we, we are not supposed to go back to the crisis. That's a statement that says uh, we, we, we address the issue of the infrastructure. So by cutting thin the issue of infrastructure development, uh, we're actually going back to the crisis instead of moving forward. So uh, if it was according to me, I would not allow this one to, to happen. Secondly, is the issue that I'm passionate about, the issue of backlog of uh, removal of, of pit latrines in our schools. Because we, 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 have, we have interrogated this question previously, I, I think for several times. But we just want to know what is actually the problem around resolving this issue of pit latrines uh, at our school at this uh, time of the uh, uh, years. So it, 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 it is really disgraceful if we are still referring to pit latrines uh, during this time of COVID. So we, do, we just want to know what is the serious problem about dealing decisively with this problem. The last question, uh, Honorable Chair, it will be uh, how many schools are affected by these 2.2 billion uh, rand deductions? And how many schools are still without basic services in terms of uh, numbers? <clears throat> uh, let me end there, Chair. The rest have, have been covered. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Honorable uh, uh, Kaiso. Honorable Tlangwini. Thank you very much, uh, Chair, um, and thank you 
uh, by the department for the presentation. Um, in short, chair, um, I'm, I'm covered by um, the one of the of the leases of the tablets. Uh, I will expect the minister to respond in that regard. Why are we leasing tablets and not buying them? Wouldn't it make more sense? to buy the tablets than to lease it. What special uh, 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 apps does this uh, 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 tablet have that you have to, to lease it? Um, and in fact, uh, a chair, the one of the, let's call it as it is, the fake sanitizers that are being happening at Alfred and Zor, the ones that we know about, and maybe perhaps it could be in all other schools that it's happening by this fake uh, uh, under uh, standard hand sanitizers that teachers putting the lives of teachers, students at risk. What is the department going to do in that regard? Because we should have by now have blacklisted as honorable depots have said those uh, suppliers or in fact better yet to go and open up criminal cases because that is attempted murder. To sell a sanitizer that doesn't have, and you know for a fact that it doesn't have 70% of the alcohol requirement that the sanitizer should have. We shouldn't leave or let our kids uh, uh, be at risk like that, Minister. And in fact, uh, Honorable Chair, we all would uh, uh, agree that it's only now that the department is sort of trying to do their work because through the years and we must even in fact maybe perhaps thank COVID-19 because many of these schools wouldn't have seen a toilet many of these schools wouldn't have seen water and it's only now because it, it, it's a requirement that this department is running around and that is why communities are stopping them because they they themselves were not doing what they are supposed to do on slide 20, Chair, and I'm running quickly, Chair, because we are pressed for time. Slide 20, regarding late payments, invoices, and on the uh, projects, which resulted in the fruitless and wasteful expenditure. Uh, what will happen to the officials responsible? Because we, we can't year in and year out accept this late payments and, all, and so forth that influence your fruitful and wasteful expenditures. What have the department put in place to prevent that? And then lastly, Chair, on the ASID DI, uh, 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 process on the underspending and underperformance on the accelerated schools and infrastructure delivery initiative. It is quite concerning, Chair, because we have seen that um, this process is supposed to improve the learning environment of rural communities. Why was there an underspending and an underperforming um, in that specific uh, uh, program? And then um, the one on the water tanks uh, chair. Also, what I need to find out, how much was one water tank and one of the Royce Royal uh, toilets that Honorable Peters was tell telling us about? Wouldn't it be better to have a proper structured toilet than this Royce Roy? Because we also want to find out how much is one of these Royce Roy toilets that were put up at, at, at these schools. Thank you very much, Chair. I will come back when you are giving us more time to engage, Chair, if there is. Thank you. Do you have, do you have one to take? One more? Chair? Do you have one more question you want to throw in? No. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I will come back, Chair. I will come back. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, Honorable Tihale. Uh, thank you very much, Chairperson, and good morning to everybody. My apology that I came late. I did not hear uh, uh, most of the, the, the presentation, but I'm happy that I ended up being part of the meeting. Uh, let me join my colleagues in thanking the DG for the presentation. Uh, I've been covered in most of the, the, the questions by the colleagues. 
especially on the issue of the, the vacancy of post. Uh, I'll wait for, for the response from the DG. And uh, again, on the, the issue of the, the, the PPEs, that is not really uh, working so well at schools, especially the, 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 the these infrared thermometers. Uh, I have heard that one other uh, AZ member just let the, the kids to go in in a day because the, the thermometer were not working. So my request is that uh, they should at least monitor so that they, they, they supply the, the correct PPEs at the school so that the children have been uh, uh, taken care of. Uh, though I must really uh, applaud the department for what they are doing, they are really trying. It's hard. COVID-19 is giving everybody a hard time, but they are trying, and our, our children are at schools. They are receiving what they are supposed to receive. I really want to applaud them on that one. And then uh, I was also covered on the issue of the toilets. But allow me, Chairperson, to say uh, actually the school needs a permanent solution when it comes to, to the toilets. Yes, we are, we are seeing these uh, funeral toilets, as the Honorable Melenza Nawal said, being delivered in our rural areas. I, I mean in Popo, but the toilets are coming from Gauteng as if we don't have uh, those type of toilets here in, in, in Polokwani. We do have them, but they are coming from Gauteng. Uh, well, there's nothing we can do. We are appreciating that they are here, but we need a, a permanent solution when it comes to these toilets. Can can we really be uh, uh, held with the, the, the answers or be given the answers as to what is the plan of the, the, the department when it comes to the permanent toilet solution to the schools. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Honorable Tihale. Honorable Joseph. Thank you, Chairperson, and uh, morning to the Minister and the Deputy and the DG and all, and thank you for the presentation. I just want to start off by saying to the, to the Minister and the Deputy Minister, um, which is not necessarily directly linked to this uh, uh, presentation, but very important, the decision to open a school or close a school, there's, there's an issue about timing a uh, chairperson. So if a school starts on a Monday, um, the, 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 the implementation of that Monday morning starts already on a Sunday, where people transport their children to the, to the school, um, per boarding schools, accommodation at other houses. And, and, and that is always important that we must remember the impact of, of, of that that, that uh, it's very important for community and parents to cooperate in that in their decisions. In other words, if a decision is made that can't be implemented in three, four, five hours later, there needs to be time for that. The the contractors, um, other members spoke about the chairperson, but I think um, in Western Cape, in Water Sanitation, Clan William Dam, we had the same problem. The issue is about local labor. Even if another company comes from another province, which is a national tender, but local labor is important and that sometimes add to the problems. Uh, Chairperson, on slide 22, the adjustment budget uh, cut in all the programs. I would like to know what does the 1.8 billion constitute the cut in that? Uh, on that slide is issues about planning and information assessment. Does that 1.8 billion include infrastructure as well? I, I saw slide 28 on capital um, uh, payments. Uh, assets, uh, payment of capital assets, but I'm not too sure if infrastructure is included in it, 1.8 billion um, there as well. Chairperson, slide 51, uh, the, uh, DG made a statement there on a permanent or temporary installation of these um, toilets or sanitation, sanitary uh, items. I would like him just to repeat that statement. I couldn't catch what you were saying. And then on that slide, the implementing agent is Rand Water. And the question I want to ask is what is the value for money on these water tanks? Because in the other departments, we also see that it's outsourced, but the department doesn't can control, have control over the value for money when the tenders go out. So I think that is important. Uh, Chairperson, the whole summary for, the, for this presentation is on slide 53. The big issue where the community versus the learners versus business, that picture tells me the state of affairs and how serious it is. I know there's a solution on slide 54, 
but it is important. And my last point, uh, Chairperson, slide 57. Slide 57, the sanitation or the toilets, as we call it. I would like to know what is the, the time frame of that? Uh, is it permanent? I heard other members asked about the cost, but I want to know, is it permanent? Because, for, in my opinion, infrastructure development, as uh, the members before me said, is actually the solution to what is the need at the schools. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you, Honorable mem Members. <clears throat> a, a, a few questions from my side. Again, welcoming the, present, the, the presentation uh, by the, the, the DG. Um, I think first I, I would like to join the oral members to condemn the hijacking of uh, projects uh, for whatever reason. I think we, sh we, should, we should be unequivocal when it comes to that. Related to that, I, I'm just trying to see uh, <clears throat> Honorable Minister DM uh, DG, why why would we get contractors from other provinces to go to other provinces? What does that do to to localization uh, and um, <clears throat> getting economies of those places uh, uh, going? That's 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 one, especially on 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 on, on construction. <clears throat> um, number two, um, one of the things that we have been challenging the departments, especially uh, uh, departments like yours, uh, Minister, with quite big budgets. It's the role of the departments in reigniting the economy. We know that the, the biggest challenge that this country is facing is the stagnant economic growth, and in fact, a negative 7.2 economic growth that we're having. And um, what is the role of the department? I'll, I'll, I'll tell you where this, this comes from. Uh, I don't know whether that's still the case, uh, but we learned that we import even stationary wrappers and everything, and mainly from China. Wouldn't the department be deliberate on trying to reignite the economy and be part of economic growth to try and um, <clears throat> um, help the process of local manufacturing? of these things, the this, this stationery, some of the papers, some of the pencils that we go and import from other countries. I, <clears throat> I've said that many times that uh, we should know that everything that we import contributes negatively uh, to the economy, let alone that that's equal to exporting uh, the jobs. So the question is, what are we doing as, as the department in, in, in trying to ensure that we, we encourage uh, localization and uh, buy produce a RSA. Perhaps uh, DG, uh, if, if on top of your head, you would know that uh, how much as a percentage and value terms of the stationery that we, we, we import. And I can't leave this one off uh, the leasing of, <clears throat> of, of, of the tablets. Uh, um, I've, I've tried to look at the reasons why would you lease rather than buying, that's number one. So I think there's a problem about just leasing uh, because it means these things are going to be taken back. And the lifespan of, 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 of a tablet usually is about uh, a, a three years uh, maximum, the, 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 the IT things. So why would we, why would we lease these things? Um, I would like to find, and uh, that, that becomes of operation expenditure instead of, 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 of CAPEX. So would, I think would like uh, to be finished with more detail. I know it's, it's a new thing. Uh, the department might still not be aware, but definitely even if it's in writing, would like to be appraised as to what exactly is happening. Uh, for me, it's, it's a no, no, no. Once you start losing these things, whereas you're supposed to be buying them. But two, the, 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 the other members have raised the question of connectivity. Do you know that these kids that are going to be given these uh, tablets are going to be able to, to connect? I always see oral members here struggling with connect uh, with with connectivity, especially from 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 the Eastern Cape. And lastly, uh, um, <clears throat> just to say, from from this adjustment uh, appropriation adjustment bill, uh, if you were to say three things which are positive uh, to the to the department, uh, I'll allow the minister and uh, um, uh, uh, the team uh, to to respond. The time is uh, it's. Uh, six minutes past ten. Uh, let's go until 25, 25 to uh, 11. 
Minister. Okay, Chair, I won't take your time because some of the questions I will ask you DG to answer. I thought I should just reflect on the broad policy matters. And with respect, do what I, I always feel very uncomfortable about, of just reminding each uh, us about the relationships and the powers of national and provinces. And I think sometimes that makes even our lives difficult as to what is it that we are accountable for, which we are responsible for, because accountability, I think you'll we'll agree with me, Chair, should be placed to people who have the responsibility. So some of the matters that I hear are provincial competencies, responsibilities, monies are voted for in the provincial legislatures and accounted for there. And what we can and do I want to start with your question that on matters like the tablets, where it's provincial resources, provincial decisions around their competencies, we can ask for answers, which is what we're doing. But with due respect, we are not able to take responsibility because it's not our responsibility. It would have been a provincial responsibility to do certain services. That's one of the biggest challenges that we normally have as a sector where there's concurrency. In particular, I want to go to the infrastructure because uh, 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 members are quite correct about infrastructure and the fact that it is really an albatross on the system. To remind members that, again, as national department, we hold monies for provinces, but the implementation of infrastructure is a provincial competence. So I'm not saying don't blame us as the sector that we have not performed very well, but it is a provincial competence. The infrastructure problem programs that chair we have responsible it's, it's special projects our cd is a special project to deal with math schools so it's very specific that provinces had to give us the list of math schools in their provinces were given money by treasury to focus specifically on math schools for instance we we, we were given for instance two billion and then almost 10 billion goes to provinces so to deal with math schools to deal with electricity to deal with water and to deal with sanitation. SAFE also, it's a special project. It's not our, uh, our, our work. SAFE is also a special pro project that came about when the president asked Treasure to give us money to deal with, uh, with, with pig latrines after the two accidents. And the member is right, member, uh, that because we then run a, a program to deal with emergency, we find ourselves ready that, that there's no co a, a, a coordination. I also visited a school uh, to hand over sanitation that we were doing under SAVE. And the principal was saying, hey, I wish I was going to teach in those toilets. Because the toilets were better than the school. I had to go back to the province to say, is this what are your plans around, around the school? Because they're the ones who are supposed to be building schools. I don't have a budget to build schools in provinces and even decide which school to prioritize. So at the it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a gray area, and we're talking about it with province to say, how do we make sure that we really get a, a, a pool, a, 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 just an attraction a to make sure that we, we, we coordinate and improve our performance. On Rolls Royce toilets, I don't know what that issue is, but what I can explain to you, in areas where we had pitch latrines, it's where there is no bath services. Your bulk services, it's easier to put a toilet in how they because you can link it to a bulk service service to cost you 2,000 rands. But if I want to put a, 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 a toilet which is not a pit latrine in Kandule, it's much more expensive because you have to bring technology. So it's not Rolls Royce. That's the only thing that is available. We've searched through the market. We were able even to reduce prices. Sometimes we have 40,000 per seat in terms of technology. We're able to reduce them to 20,000 a seat. It was not easy. But it's the nature of the environment that forces us to do certain technologies because of lack of bulk services. And that's why I think they are more expensive, but I don't think they are Rolls Royces. The last one I read it because I don't want to take most of the work. Can I show members that food handlers were trained in, in COVID-19. Teachers, teachers, provinces are employers of teachers. We don't employ teachers. The employers of teachers are provinces, and we constantly assist them to identify first we train we try to train teachers for them 
We're now currently running a program to identify with them unemployed teachers in different provinces so, so that we can assist. And that has happened successfully. Provinces that have an oversupply of teachers and really get those teachers to come to areas where there's undersupply. For instance, at some stage in the Eastern Cape, we just had an undersupply of African teaching teachers. We had to work out with Western Cape to assist in recruiting African-speaking teachers to go and fill posts in the Eastern Cape. But it is teachers that are, are, are uh, it is provinces that are, are employers. The last one also, Chair, which I, I really want to talk about, is about this local procurement. And the first call, as you correctly said, Chair, is to employ local people. But there are two things also that we wish members to consider, that there are laws around infrastructure. The law will say to build a structure for 100 million, which is some of the schools that were contested, which are boarding schools and very large schools, you are supposed to be at a level that is at a particular level. If you are level one, by law, we can't give you. So if you are in the Eastern Cape and you don't have perhaps level six for 100 million schools, by law, we are not able to give you. And that's what's been a difficulty. That's what we've been struggling with uh, members. And committees rightfully feel that they're giving crumbs, the big contracts go to the big boys, which is a broader problem around infrastructure to say, who are the people who have enough, who have the legal levels to take jobs of a certain category? So that's a big thing. The other big thing also about local, which is broader than us, which is actually a question of trade and industry. I know of only two companies in the country that produces uh, your, your and DG will have, have to help me, your stationery. So it's a bigger problem than us, but it's a problem of trade and industry in terms of industrialization of the country. That there are only two, which is a problem. There are not too many countries, so which means we have not ourselves as a country built the adequate capacity to serve the needs of this country. So that's one problem that I know around stationery is happening. But the other problem, again, Chair, around procurement it's also getting the balance right and in terms of economies of scale, but also being able to, to, to get the right product. You see, you will go to a province like Eastern Cape where there is no industri industrial capacity to think you'll buy sanitizers well, when there's no one who produces That's why they finally give you water. Whereas, again, it's the whole question about balancing, getting your balance right to say that it's no company that is producing your alcohol in the in the, in the Eastern Cape. And if you are going to be playing, yes. no. if you are going to be, Chair, no, let me finish. On a point of order. Uh, Robert, can we allow the no. minister to? Uh, uh, let me finish. I, I didn't, I on didn't on stop on members. On a point of order, Chair, or uh, please let us come back. No, there is misleading. Robert, can we? The please. minister to finish, please. Um, Chair, uh, please take off the meeting. Uh, Thank you. Hi, Chair. I am going to give answers the way I understand them. If uh, members are not happy, and I'm not going to be heckled by uh, by EFFS, it normally does and disrespect people with their own platforms. I'm not going to take long. I'm saying the, uh, the, the long and short is I'm saying we need to get the balance right. As much as I fully appreciate that we have to give locals opportunities, but I'm saying in some instances, there are difficulties in in negotiating between, between the two. On tablets, Chair, I already am equally shocked and disgusted. We've asked for an explanation. The province will give you an answer in writing. So, so that's what I'm saying. And that's what I want to say, Chair. On, uh, DG? Uh, thank you, Honorable Chair, Honorable Members, uh, Honorable Minister. Uh, uh, Chair, I see that <laughs> there is an average of five questions per, me per member. I'm not going to attempt to answer all of them. Minister has uh, covered some of them. DG, uh, DG, but if you look at, at some of the questions, they are intersect intersecting. Uh, they are not that's just correct. Yeah, so. That's correct, Chair. Yes, I will, yeah. I will not repeat them. Yes. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, there was a question by Honorable Mlenzane about centralization versus decentralization. We are both. 
Uh, there is procurement that's happening in the department. There is also procurement happening in implementing agents, especially for infrastructure. So we are decentralized in that way. For instance, we use IDT, we use KUHA, we use DVSA, we use Vola Trust. Our procurement happens there. At some point, even at uh, the, the, the SCOPA, uh, we once indicated to them that uh, we would want to have the presence of the department in their procurement committee, and SCOPA advised against that. They said, no, you can't uh, give this responsibility to an implementing agent at the same time you get in and want to oversee what they are doing. You need to hold them accountable in terms of the work that they do. So we are decentralized in that way. But the minister also explained, this is vote 16. Vote 16 is basic education, national department only. Equitable share, it's in the provinces. Where you see us, for instance, in CD and others, it's for a short time. A CD comes to an end, I think, next year, March, and the CFO can just confirm. My understanding is that uh, a CD comes to an end next year, March. By next year, March, we'll be out of these provinces. As the minister said, it's their responsibility to deliver infrastructure. Our responsibility is to monitor and support. They can post chair. This has been asked by many. The, <clears throat> the main reason why there's been a delay in filling this vacant post, and these are not teacher posts. These are chief director's posts. These are director's posts, which were filled before. Some of the people have been uh, uh, promoted to DDG, and they left those posts <clears throat> vacant. And it took some time for us to fill them because we were restructuring uh, and reorganizing the department. The business intelligence unit, for instance, was not there before. Mrs. Geyer's line function has accommodated some of the functions from curriculum. It took us about a year to reorganize, restructure the department. And that's what caused the delay. And we can give you, and there are not many, I don't think uh, it can exceed 10%, <clears throat> if anything. Those posts are not many. They should be around 5 or 6%. But we can, we can give you those details. Uh, cuts in the EIG, I think we've, we've all seen them. That's where the major cut is. Uh, we didn't necessarily volunteer the cut. The Honorable Chair, I remember at some stage, was the Deputy Minister of Finance. The way things work in finance, they say to you, uh, volunteer a cut. If you don't, they will cut even bigger and in the wrong places uh, that you wouldn't expect cuts to happen. So we were working with the National Treasury team to help us do uh, uh, these cuts. Uh, the issue of the toilets, the minister has, has covered that. That's why when we presented, we said emergency water and sanitation. It's for three months only. Beyond three months, provinces are taking over that responsibility. I think I've responded to about three or, or four honorable members who asked about this. It's for emergency. For, for three months, 600 million beyond the three months, then uh, provinces are taking over that responsibility, which is theirs. Uh, uh, the issue of the procurement of COVID essentials, Honor Honorable Sarah Penn, um, yes, indeed, and I think the minister covered this. The issue of quality we have raised. We've been monitoring. We've <clears throat> gotten provinces to return some of the things that they had procured and to remove some of the service providers or even blacklist them from the list of service providers that uh, uh, government will be procuring from. NSMP, we're still able to meet the uh, requirement of the court. Uh, indeed, feeding for those who are at school, those who are at home, in different modalities, the presentation contains all of those mod modalities. Projects affected in provinces, we can give you details of that, but wouldn't have it... Uh, um, immediately, and we can get that list for you to show you provinces to submit and tell us which are the projects which are affected, but there are many of them that are indeed affected. Uh, Chair, um, the policy of allowing local contractors, I just want to humbly request that we shouldn't be saying that uh, when we deliver projects, it should only be service providers uh, in a particular province, we should participate. The law of the country doesn't allow for that. 
but we can also provide information to show in respect of infrastructure how many contractors come from the Eastern Cape. And I bet the little money that I have, over 90% would come from Luca. Over 90% would come from Luca. And at least we can make it available to you. And now, as the minister said, we only go outside if you don't have the people uh, who are able to handle certain projects which are much bigger than uh, probably what they are allowed to handle. But we give them more projects so that over time they are able to handle even bigger projects. Um, uh, so that, that's, that's the response there, Honorable Chair. And then the issue of the tablets, what I can say is that the Premier and the MEC of, the, of Education in the Eastern Cape, they have instituted an investigation on uh, procurement of uh, ICT and devices uh, in the Eastern Cape. My advice would be probably we could wait for the outcomes of that, uh, of that investigation. I saw the article, um, I think in the past week or so, a few days, I saw it, but I was told that the Premier has instituted an investigation on, on this matter together with the... With the, with the Premier. Um, yes, thank you very much for the advice to involve the police. There's been an attempt to do that um, in terms of those people who are hijacking projects and so on. Uh, but I must say that it's a very big hindrance in many ways. Um, small businesses that are affected by failure to pay them on time uh, quite honestly, we try to do our best. We're even working during the lockdown to make sure that uh, every person who does business with us is indeed paid. There are instances where, you know, there's fruitless and wasteful expenditure because of certain delays that were happened. But I'm not aware of uh, business people who got adversely affected because we are unable to pay within 30 days. In fact, we submit that report every month to National Treasury. We have to submit it uh, uh, every month we do submit it. Um, the issue of NSNP, the training does happen, not only in terms of COVID, it's been something that has been happening all along. There's a, there, there's a, a, a diet that has to be followed every day, which is worked out by experts from the Department of Health and our officials, and uh, uh, the food handlers keep to uh, what is provided for in terms of the guide uh, e e with respect to the diet. And the issue of uh, the quality of COVID essentials has been covered. Um, infrastructure. The problem, Honorable Kaiso, is that indeed, as the Honorable Chair indicated, we've been contributing um, in terms of uh, igniting the economy. Our major contribution has been um, uh, from infrastructure. And with this major cut from infrastructure, it means that it our, contribution, our contribution has been reduced. And the other point here that I need to cover at the same time, the masks that you see, before we started pro procuring masks, masks were procured from China. And when we came in, we said we've got industries and factories that have collapsed in the Western Cape, in Gauteng, in KZN. And we said we are going to procure locally. So uh, our COVID essentials that we started procuring as basic education, we worked with DTI and we stimulated activities in factories that had closed, factories that were you know, going to close in a while or so. So that's another contribution that we are making. Stationary, the minister is right. These companies are only in Durban. There are three of them. You actually know them by name, but they also um, get their materials from overseas because, the, you know, it's, it's cheaper from where they are getting, but the companies, the companies that are involved with stationery are only in Debe, and they are supplying the whole country in terms of stationery for, um, for, for basic education. Uh, the issue of tablets has been covered, fake sanitizers, we've dealt with them. The uh, slight number, uh, the issue of late payment I've also dealt with. Uh, the issue of under expenditure, maybe the honorable member uh, arrived uh, slightly late. I explained why. I gave three reasons, if you remember, Chair. 
One of them was the local business people who insist that everything, not some, the law is very clear. If you take an outside person, 30% must go for local economic uh, uh, activity. It's very clear, and we are keeping to the, we even go beyond 30%. We've insisted that implementing agents must actually go beyond 30%. And Honorable Dikhale, thank you for uh, applauding us a little bit. It doesn't always come. Uh, it can be difficult, so we appreciate. The issue of the thermometers, we've picked up that some of the people had not read the manual. The manual says if the thermometer is put under very cold conditions, it does not work. You have to find a place to put it. That's what the manual says. And uh, later on, when we communicated this to people, they were able to handle. They thought there was something wrong with the thermometers. And then we realized that we didn't read the manual. The last but one chair is Honorable, uh, I think, Joseph. I, I think he's made a very good point about the announcement for getting learners to return. The minister has, has taken that. Local labor has explained that. Maybe the CFO can explain a little bit the 1.8 billion. I think uh, that was probably the cut that, that was taken from infrastructure EIG. But maybe the CFO can just uh, explain it a little bit. Value for money um, in terms of emergency uh, water and sanitation. I think uh, the, uh, the, the head of uh, the branch can just say two, uh, 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 two minutes uh, on that, just explaining about the project. I've indicated that it's an emergency project, uh, project of, of three months only. And the last uh, one is the Honorable Chair. Um, I've explained the issue of getting contractors from outside. The minister has also explained that. I've also explained the role of the department, uh, the issue of stationary, uh, the special adjustment, what is good about it. Uh, maybe in terms of the conditional grants, it has afforded us the opportunity to move funds around. That's one big positive chair that I can point out to the special adjustment. Uh, other than that, I think it has done an indelible uh, mark on the sector. I'm just going to request the CFO and the head of infrastructure two minutes each just to explain uh, the issues that I've referred to. Thank you very much. Thank you, DJ. Okay. Thank you, uh, uh, Chairperson and uh, Honorable Members. Uh, I'll, I'll talk to slide, I think it's slide uh, 22, which uh, the Honourable Member spoke to, uh, which which relates to, to, to the 1.812 billion, as, as well as uh, the 181 million. The 1.812 billion relates to planning, and the 181 million uh, relates to curriculum support. Just to give a breakdown, starting with the 1.812 billion, as the DG explained correctly, so uh, the bulk of that uh, is uh, education infrastructure grant, which uh, is uh, 1.621 billion. So basically, given the fact that uh, we were required to to contribute uh, a, a, a substantive cut of our budget, because uh, infra, uh, education infrastructure grant forms the bulk of our budget, it was uh, it, it it just followed that uh, that was the the place where the bulk of the cut could come through. As the DG explained, if we, 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 we just left it to Treasury, they could have cut maybe elsewhere. So I'm saying 1.621 billion of that 1.8 billion is EIG, and the rest, which is uh, 191 million, it's internal projects like uh, systemic evaluation, uh, 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 national assessment. So I'm saying the bulk is that. The other amount which the Honourable Member spoke to on that slide 22, as I said, is 181 million 
of curriculum projects. And the breakdown is 23 million out of that is a metric uh, uh, second chance. 71 million is uh, workbooks and 85 million is internal cards, uh, uh, basically catering, traveling, uh, SNT venues and, uh, and, and, and facilities. Because as all of us know, uh, with the advent of COVID, uh, most of these things don't happen anymore. We don't travel anymore. We don't book venues anymore. We don't do catering anymore because most of the meetings are held uh, uh, online. Uh, I'll stop there, DG and Honorable Chair. Thanks. Good, Good morning. This is David van der Westhuizen, Head of Infrastructure. Uh, greetings to the Honorable Chair and all the Honorable Members, uh, Minister, DM and DG. Just quickly response on infrastructure. I think a lot of it has been covered by by the DG. I think just on the water supply and sanitation, it's important to note that we differentiate between the infrastructure solution and the service solution. And you will bear with me if I say that water supply and sanitation is in essence a municipal function and not an education function. So if we differentiate between the infrastructure being the building or the pipe or the whatever on site versus the service. So when we, when we under the COVID realize we need to open schools and this becomes a very prominent issue, we then engage with the provinces in, in one on one meetings and we ask them, please identify in your province which schools will not be able to open because of a water supply issue and which schools will not be able to open because of a sanitation issue. So all those schools were identified by the provinces. And I think the minister has highlighted very clearly the differentiate between our, our role and their role. So under the emergency situation, we then provided solutions that cater for both of these, cater for both the infrastructure as well as the service. So in the Randwater contract, we then provided tanks and the delivery of water to those tanks. In the case of sanitation, we provided the temporary toilet and the servicing of that toilet. So uh, under the emergency. But obviously, this is not a long term thing. It, it can't carry on like that. So the long term solution, and I think DG alluded to that, is that the long term solution is we must go back to the responsibilities where it belongs. As infrastructure sector, we must make sure that the right infrastructure is on site. If we need a tank, put a tank there. If we need uh, a tap, put a tap there. If we need toilets, put the toilets there. But then engage with the service provider who's responsible for providing the service, which is the municipality. So we have now in our engagement with, with Cocta, Misa and Salga, we have started to prepare a data set of all schools. We've got close on 24,000 public schools. For every school on a one-on-one -on -one basis, we've now mapped this school is under this water service authority area of jurisdiction. And this water service authority have engaged with other entities in terms of water services providers. So we have one-on-one -on -one mapping of to say which school belongs to which authority, to which provider, what is the closest municipal water treatment works or even water, wastewater treatment works to that school where you should connect and trying to get the contact persons of all of those because that's the long-term solution. In the meantime, we are engaging with provinces, and I think the, the DG mentioned we have six o'clock every morning meetings with every provincial head of infrastructure to confirm, do you have schools that will not open because of water? Do you have schools that will not open because, and they have all confirmed this morning at six o'clock again, all schools are open. There are minor, in the, uh, minor ones um, in one of the provinces where there are specific issues, and we can give you even the names of those specific issues. We're even tracking issues of vandalism and storm damage, trying to agree that. Um, there was one question about the cost of tanks, which I don't think there was a response to. Through the Randwater contract, we procured the tanks from about 40 different service providers. Um, there were a couple of uh, parliamentary questions in this regard, and we have provided a lot of detailed answers on that. All I can say is that it was bought from about 40 different uh, suppliers. We basically bought, bought all tanks that's available in the country. We bought all of them. The, the average cost of a 5,000 litre tank 
was I think 5019, if, if that is what was required. Thank you, sir. Thank you. DG, that's it, eh? DG? Yeah. Yeah. In, 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 uh, Minister? Um, that's correct, Chair. I'm sorry. That's it. That's oh, it. Sir. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, the We have already overrun our our time, but I would like just to make a, a few uh, clo close closing closing remarks. Um, thank thank the minister and 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 the and the, depart and the department for the engagement. Obviously, it's a big department. We have preferred to have more time with the department, and I think would like to. Yes, yes. Sorry, sorry, before you close, and um, um, I really apologize. Before you close, um, one of two things, Chair, can the department just <clears throat> send uh, on in writing uh, a proper of the 40 supplies that they've got the tanks from um, and the cost thereof um, so that we have it on record? And then also, uh, Chair, um, from my side, I really don't feel that I was adequately answered and it's and, it, and it's a lie what the minister is saying. Um, it's misleading, in fact, to say that there's no sanitizing companies in the Eastern Cape. We can't accept an answer like that. And she needs to take responsibility for her department. She is a, a national minister. And thus to always throw back the, the province, the province, the province. They need to run the department chair. And for me in that aspect, uh, I'm not adequately answered, and I, I will have to take further steps. That this department has to be held accountable. Thank you, Chair. Just hold, just hold, Honorable Lenzan. Just hold. Finish, Honorable Kangini. Because we are the Appropriations Committee Chair, and we are not your normal committee where you go and account as your as your department. We are the appropriations committee, and we are dealing with rents and cents. And for to give for a minister to give a, a answer that there's no sanitizers in in Eastern Cape or companies that produce sanitizer in Eastern Cape and so forth, it's misleading, and we can't accept answers like okay. that, chair, to mislead us like that. Kids is gonna die. Teachers is gonna die, and that will be on her conscience and her department's conscience. So are you going to give me the right of reply if you yeah. are going yeah. to allow her to continue saying yeah. things which are seen Honor and wrong? Honorable Minister, just hold. Honorable Lenzana. Uh, th th thanks, Chairperson. Per perhaps what Honorable Minister is coming up with is exactly what I was going to ask for. Let me put my neck on the block, Chairperson. As one culprit yesterday who agreed that uh, the division of uh, these discussions be equal, it looks like let's appeal for your indulgence that we take a little ten minutes from from uh, the other the other department because we cannot close this discussion at this particular note. What I would then, Honourable Minister, ask for is that uh, if if we as members of parliament feel that there were areas where we would need more ex explanation. We ask that those questions that the department has provided be submitted to us via the secretary in writing so that we are able to continue with interaction. And further, Minister, ask if, for instance, because the reality is that we are the ones who are appropriating even the provinces. If perhaps uh, without, you know, getting into the pros and cons of how you run the department in terms of uh, the powers and functions, that we may invite the Honorable Minister and the department when we call these provinces, which seem to have challenges. Th thanks, Mr. President. Honorable Minister, briefly. Not, uh, let me respectfully uh, accept uh, Member Mlenzani's uh, proposal that if there are issues that are still outstanding, we'll do in writing, but also raise serious objections to the approach of the member and say, I just think she is out of order and I will not tolerate her bullying tactics. Okay. Um,
uh, honorable uh, minister and your <clears throat> and your department i think what we'll also do uh, from from our side uh, will will uh, prefer the department with uh, the questions which we think would like the department to to answer and minister please bear with 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 the committee with the best of intentions it's very difficult for us to have nine provinces nine MECs uh, coming to appear be, uh, before our, our ourselves so we'll, we'll rely on, on on the minister through the through the structures that you are having uh, including your C CM and all other structures that uh, <clears throat> at the end of the day when the minister comes even if she brings a, a full team of of uh, um, uh, MECs in some instances or, or, or the heads of departments because we will find ourselves having to ask about everything and anything which happens under the under under, under the department and i must say oral members that uh, um, we have got time pressure honorable mlenzana we already about uh, we've taken about 12 minutes more from the time that we we, we we had allocated but i think let's 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 follow that approach we'll we'll we'll, we'll send the, the the department questions um, and just say, Minister, we must still engage on, on, on these issues. As you know, that the, the questions of education, they are closer to all of us and uh, they, uh, they evoke a lot of emotions and so on. But I think we are, we are all um, uh, <clears throat> requested just to, to be very uh, uh, <clears throat> balanced and, and, and try to be unemotional about them, emotional as they are. But thank you very much. It's our first interaction with, with the with, with the department, and and definitely we are still going to 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 to, in, to interact. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Deputy Minister. Thank you, TG and your team. Uh, uh, good luck with your engagements. We we do appreciate the challenges that you are having in the whole of, of the country. Thank you. The, um, um, we we may allow you to to leave, and uh, yeah. Uh, thank allow you very much, Chair, and thanks to the members. Thank you, thank, Chair. Thank you, thank you, Minister. Thank uh, you, Chair. Thank you, thank you, DM. Um, honourable members, I, I, I know you didn't even have a, a, a cup of tea. Um, Darren, can can you just uh, request uh, the Minister of Small Business Development just to give us five minutes? We're just uh, picking up the cup of tea and uh, stretching, and then we'll be in five minutes. We'll be back. Please, honourable mm -hmm. members. And, and grab your cup of tea so that you can engage. Thanks, Chairperson. Thank the boy, yeah, yeah. yeah. What time are we coming back? Five minutes, five minutes, five minutes. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. Thank the you. Boy, you are, Chairperson. Yeah, muted. Yeah, I can hear you now. I was saying take a stretch and walk in the sun a little bit. <laughs> as long as it's going to take you five minutes. Yeah, yeah. Chairperson.
كارين كارين تشابرزون او وي نيوت ماي ريكويست كارين تشابرزون are you winning with my request with uh, from that we get more time um i think it's fine chair i've sent the request through to the ict people they said it's fine okay that's 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 fine i see i see minister uh, chavin it's it's on the screen on already uh, good morning minister uh, good morning chaperson how are you today i'm good how are you i'm all right thank you Please accept our apologies for keeping you waiting. Uh, you know, the matters education, they always, you know, so we, we are just about to start in a minute or two. And um, you are welcome. Thanks. <clears throat> the appeal. The appeal. The appeal. Good. Okay, good. <clears throat> um, Darren? Chairperson? Are the honorable members back? I'm back, Chairperson. I see Honorable Joseph. Who else is back? Kaiso is also back. Honorable Kaiso, you are back. Who else? Matafa is back. Yes, uh, Matafa is back. <laughs> Lenzana is in, Chair. From Toram Lenzana is in. Still waiting? Where is Peter's? Where is Tihale? I see Tihale is back. Um, okay, I I think what we'll do. <laughs> she's smiling, but she was unmute. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can see she's 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 back. Um, I think all members. Let's 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 let's. Start. Um, let let me start by welcoming uh, Minister Chaveni. Uh, Minister's Small Business Development. Uh, Minister, thank you very much for honoring the, 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 the presentation. Uh, we are busy, we are in a uh, standing committee on appropriations. So we are busy with the appropriation amendments, uh, amendment bill, uh, which also af af affects your department. Um, <clears throat> so wanted just to interact with your department and, 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 and hear you out. Uh, we did send a letter of the things that we are expecting from you, but uh, you don't necessarily need to follow that one to the to the letter. You may share with us some very juicy stuff from the department. So, um, with those few words, allow the minister to to to, to come in. Minister, you have uh, for for presentation uh, thirty minutes for the whole presentation 30 minutes and then oral members will, will 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 come in interact with the presentation mainly asking clarification and and and, and question and allow uh, you and your team again to to come back uh, with, with, with with that we still do your whole uh, 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 <clears throat> uh, one and a half hours that i'm just saying in all that we had initially provided for interacting with your department uh, minister remember it's a it's your, it's your maiden appearance before the Central Committee on Appropriations. <laughs> Thank you, Chairperson. Uh, I would have wished that the appearance takes place at a, a better time than the times that we're in. Personally, I have a bereavement in the family, but I took the opportunity to join yourselves because I think what you're doing is important, not only for the country, but also for small businesses in general. We, we would have wished also that we had a, a, a much more a detailed engagement with the Appropriations Committee because we hold the view that in South Africa we acknowledge that small businesses will play a critical role in resuscitating the economy of the country as it is, is doing in other countries and other in Europe, Western Europe, Russia, China, the economies are driven by small businesses. Though we appreciate that in terms of our country, but we continue to act big business, both in terms of what we appropriate for small businesses. If we look at what the, NDP, uh, the NDP proposes, that by 2030, 
uh, more than 90 percent uh, of the GDP, no, more than 90 percent of jobs must be created from small businesses, but more than 70 percent of the GDP must be contributed by small businesses. But our allocations in terms of budget, it doesn't match that. Even when government makes interventions, the interventions are not are sufficient. If we look at the example during now the COVID uh, pandemic, we could only manage to gather amongst our own program, 530 million rands to do relief for small businesses directly. And if you look, now we are engaging with the national treasury around the national credit guarantee scheme of more than 200 billion, which is going to go to 300 billion. And this, though it said it's going to benefit small businesses, if you look at the threshold in terms of the definition of small business, SMEs in South Africa, that money is largely going to what is previously advantaged and, and it continues to exclude majority of small businesses. We continue to engage with National Treasury. We have given them a proposal on the participation of CIFA uh, under our guidance to make sure that we can then be able to assist the small businesses. But I think this appropriations committee uh, has a, a, a much important role in interrogating the appropriations, whether the appropriations will indeed contribute to the recovery of the economy. I accept that on our part as a department and our agencies, we still have a long way to go to earn our place as the shining stars of the of government in terms of driving the SME agenda. At times, our pace of responses have been slow, despite our good intentions and the best of our programs. And we are working on our part to make sure that we deal with those limitations and we can account for a better improvement, in both in terms of efficiencies in terms of um, turnaround times, and we are doing our best. And if you compare where we are today and where we've been before, there is indeed an improvement, but the improvement is not good enough. We are also trying to use uh, technology to make sure that we've got a better reach. We are also trying to work with partners in terms of uh, small go uh, local government in municipality, and this is supporting the district-based development model so that we can strengthen our reach and make sure that the most smallest or the most informal of a small business can be assisted by our department. But with that, Chairperson, I'd like to hand over to the team to make the presentation. I'm accompanied today by the Chairperson of CIFA Board, Mr. Martin Mahosi, the acting DG of the department, Mr. Lindo Kutlem Kumani, the acting uh, CEO of CIFA, Mr. Slakalane Mulepo, and the acting CEO of CIDA, uh, Mrs. Ndogozo Majola, and they are all supported by the executive teams that they work with them. And we appreciate the opportunity and we accept the, the delays understandably with the engagement with the Department of Edu Basic Education. Thank you. Over to the DG, if we may, Chairperson. Uh, Oral Minister, uh, please accept our condolences for the bereavement at home. That's, that's, that's the one, and we really appreciate you are coming here. Uh, and two, Please just take your seat a little bit. I want to see the whole of you. Yeah, that's 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 it. Um, okay, then I'll allow your team. You'll just you'll you'll just go. Um, let's say from here and it's 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 it's, it's eight, time it's eleven, so you, you can go up to 20, uh, 20 past a, a, a team. If you stretch it, you may stretch it to half past. It's fine. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, Honourable Members and Minister. Uh, I will project uh, the presentation from my side. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I will try and be quick so that we can have more time on the discussions. Chair, this is the outline of the presentation. Um, I'm not going to go into details because we'll touch on these issues uh, as we go through each and every slide. Just as an introduction, uh, that I think everyone is aware that a state of national disaster was declared, and then we were requested as a department uh, of small business development to come up with interventions that will cushion SMMEs, cooperatives and informal businesses because most of them were not operational, especially under level five uh, because of the regulations that were also issued. 
the president did announce 500 billion fiscal package and it was indicated that out of the 500 billion 130 billion will come from the reprioritization of existing uh, baselines which means departments had to uh, cut their budgets or reduce their budgets by 20 percent uh, we did all those uh, processes and uh, we submitted our revised um, database and business case to national Treasury by the 22nd of may then the on the impact uh, i won't go into too much details but sms and cooperatives in particular were seriously affected as we all know that most of them were unable to operate um, that's why we had to come up with various interventions of which the key one was the debt relief because we wanted to make sure that at least SMEs still have a space to operate on, so assisting them with paying rent. We also assisted them uh, with the payment of uh, utilities because we know we couldn't ask municipalities uh, to defer payments uh, because they don't, even the municipalities themselves, they don't have money. So we thought we have to assist uh, businesses to be able to carry those costs. And then the last one, which we negotiated the legislature stage with Department of Employment and Labor because most of the businesses did not uh, register their employees on UIF so we had to also make sure that people don't uh, go without any salaries we can partially fund uh, or support the, the salaries of the employees. For the department uh, because of um, reprioritization that we did um, National Treasury reduced um, our budget uh, by 67 million in terms of the money that was taken from the 2020-2021 financial year. Change specifically in terms of the targets that we had to revise uh, because of the budget cuts or reprioritization, um, we had a target of uh, supporting 100 SMEs and cooperatives through blended finance. We had to remove this target uh, for the 2020-21 financial year and reprioritize because the money was uh, repurposed for supporting uh, the COVID uh, response. On the 1,000 cooperatives supported to the value of 87 million, we had to reprioritize that because the cooperatives budget was cut. Uh, we are remaining with 63 million. And then on the 700 majority black owned SMME supported through PPSDP, we had to reprioritize the budget. Uh, I will talk to this oh, on how we are going to on how we are going to support uh, the, the these uh, uh, SMMEs uh, going forward. Chair, in terms of the interventions that we came up with uh, to support, especially those enterprises that are based in the townships and rural areas, we decided that we shouldn't take the approach of coming up with a blanket scheme uh, for uh, informal businesses. Let's go into details on each and every inf type of informal business and customize the interventions uh, for these informal businesses. So this is the list of um, uh, uh, sub sectors within the informal business space that we came up with. Um, we were able to allocate some budget, even though it was not sufficient. Uh, we are indicating on the far right slide or the last slide on the right hand side the deficit for each and every scheme because of the numbers that we had targeted and the amounts that we had set aside but mainly what we are doing here chair is to support informal businesses to formalize we are supporting them to develop what we call a credit record because if they want to grow and become big and become competitive they need to have some sort of credit record uh, so that they can be able to access money from uh, other financial institutions so we are supporting them uh, uh, with the equipment those that need equipment those that need stock we support them with stock and um, we also support uh, them with access to infrastructure okay so those are the schemes uh, the chisanyamas uh, the spaza shops uh, some are, are being uh, launched some have already uh, started operating but what we know chair is that with these interventions that we've come up with we are changing the way the economy of the rural and township areas is functioning. We want to make sure that they are formalized, they also come into the mainstream economy. Some of them will go and become really big businesses. Chair, this is also the rest of the interventions. Uh, some, like I indicated, are operational, some are being launched. Uh, I will 
just want to talk to the last one there, Chair, the Small Enterprise Manufacturing Program, which is the program that we are going to utilize to drive localization because uh, COVID, I think, exposed us as a country that we don't have enough um, things that we are producing as a country. So as a Department of Small Business Development, we are going to drive localization, especially through our SMEs and cooperatives, and make sure that we have um, goods that are produced locally. We've already identified them. We have interacted with the big uh, retailers. They've given us list of the products that uh, they are procuring from outside in particular that can be manufactured locally. So that, that will be the big scheme that will be driving uh, that will really change the way uh, uh, SMEs are viewed in this country. Chair, this is the total uh, funding requirement. Uh, we are indicating there uh, that we are supported by uh, the DTIC. They contributed 200 million, which is the money that will go uh, to be part of this small scale manufacturing facility. Um, in terms of our budget, uh, there is a budget that was prioritized last year. Uh, which is a total of 316 million. Uh, we will talk to that um, a little bit later. And then we also reprioritize the budget that was set aside for this uh, financial, which is uh, 1.2 billion. So the total budget that is available for interventions is 1.7 billion. We still need uh, 52 billion, of which Minister has spoken to that issue that we are engaging with National Treasury through the National Credit Guarantee Scheme. In terms of our baseline, what was reduced uh, this current financial aid is 67 million, um, of which most of the money was taken from goods and services. But uh, there is a slide that talks to that. Um, then the representation of 1.2 billion to CIFA also resulted in significant reduction of the internal administrative incentives because what we did, we thought it's not useful for us to keep money within us and also have CIFA administering certain incentives. So we reprioritize our budget and we uh, ask CIFA to, ra to run with the interventions. And we have a structure that uh, sits almost every week where we look at how uh, we are dispersing funding, how we are uh, formulating the programs that are responding both to the COVID as well as the economic recovery. Chair, this is the uh, allocation uh, of the department, I won't uh, dwell much, uh, but we do have the enterprise development and entrepreneurship branch, which is the biggest. That's where most of the money is. The money that goes to see that uh, is from that particular branch, which is which is around 800 million, 850 million, goes to see that. And then we have this 1.2 billion also coming from this branch, and it goes to CIFA for those uh, interventions that we've developed. And then we have a branch integrated cooperatives. Uh, where we have 140 million, and then the incentive scheme that supports cooperatives comes from that particular branch. And then we have the smallest branch, sector policy and research, uh, which has 28 million, and then administration, which has 129 million. Then this is the allocation per economic classification, uh, transfers and subsidies. I think this is the money that goes to supporting businesses, it's 2 billion, and then goods and services is 89 million. A compensation for employees is 162 million, and machinery and equipment is uh, just above 4 million. Chair, this is the um, adjusted budget in terms of what was cut, uh, totaling that uh, 67 million from administration, 6.4 uh, 6 million was cut, from sector policy and research, 8.1 million was cut. And then under integrated cooperatives, it's that 30 million that was cut from the uh, cooperative incentive scheme, and then some money from goods and services. And then under enterprise development and entrepreneurship, uh, 36 uh, million was, was cut from that uh, uh, particular branch. Chair, these are the further details in terms of where exactly the money, the money 67 million came from. You see on that, uh, Second column from my right hand side, we have uh, 28 million that was taken from goods and services, uh, which is the money that we normally use to travel. At least uh, we are not traveling these days, so we are not going to be affected that much. And some of the money that was taken was from the consultants, um, so money was reduced from those to make up for that 28 million. And then under transfers and subsidies, 
you'll see that uh, we're talking about 39 million, of which 29 million came from the Township and Entrepreneurship Fund, and then 10 million came from Cooperative Incentive Scheme, making that 39 million. And then 39 plus 28 is the 67 million that was uh, taken back to National Treasury. Chair, like I indicated a little bit earlier, what has assisted us, uh, we know that uh, we, they say we, we should not waste a good crisis. What we did uh, early this year, on the 4th of March in particular, cabinet approved what we call a township and rural entrepreneurship program, which is a program that is really aimed at supporting um, enterprises that are based in the township and rural areas. So this pandemic assisted us to accelerate the implementation of this program. We established a, what we call an economic recovery task team, which is made up of the department as well as the entities where we sit and discuss uh, the response as well as monitor the implementation of this response. Then we have what we call a plan for economic recovery and small business support, um, which uh, we've developed, we've presented uh, to the cluster, uh, which was well received because it shows exactly how we're going to be tackling uh, the support for small business and make sure that they are part of the economic recovery of this country. This plan chair is aligned to our 2025 strategic plan as well as 2021 annual, annual performance plan. Then we implemented these interventions that, and these interventions, it's important to emphasize that they fall under normal business operations of the department as well as the entities. So uh, the advancing of support uh, to small businesses is what we do on our daily, on a daily basis. But uh, we've, I think, gone a little bit step further and ensured that informal businesses re receive special attention during this uh, uh, period. Um, Chair, we still have the approval structures uh, that were put in place, so we're not reckless in uh, advancing support to small businesses. Credit committees said to look at these uh, uh, applications. Due diligence was done to make sure that we fund the right people. We also, Chair, engage with the private sector stakeholders uh, to work with, especially commercial banks. They are really very supportive, especially on this buzzer short support initiative, as well as other informal business initiatives. Then we have guidelines, Chair, that guide in terms of how we fund these projects, and these guidelines are followed uh, to the latter to make sure that we don't have uh, adverse findings, especially when it comes to uh, AG uh, reviewing our reports. Then, Chair, in terms of mitigation strategies to ensure continued support, we have uh, gone a little bit step further. We have engaged with various government departments, uh, the CITAS, because they have a lot of resources and the reach. Uh, they can support us in terms of providing some of the support in terms of training. Private sector organizations are also part uh, of our engagements. We meet almost on a weekly basis, especially led by the minister, engaging with the private sector because we need their support uh, to make sure that our businesses uh, uh, survive and they grow. Uh, and uh, be part of the economic recovery. There are partnerships that we've established with various uh, stakeholders in the SME and cooperatives ecosystem. Uh, this partnership, they ensure that certain programs can be co-funded because we don't have, have all the resources as a department. We also rely on co-funding uh, by other uh, partners. Just uh, for as an example, uh, on the debt relief, we had a sum of the money, as Minister indicated, which is, was 530 million, but the demand uh, on this scheme was overwhelming. Um, the applications that we had totaled 5 billion, uh, meaning that we had a deficit of 4.6 billion. Uh, so you could see that uh, this uh, COVID really had a great impact on SMEs and cooperatives. Then in terms of advancement of triple BEE, triple BEE is very close to us. Um, like we indicated that we have this uh, township and, and rural entrepreneurship program approved by cabinet, which is really aimed at driving um, SMMEs and cooperatives support. Um, we also have programs that we are developing, some we've developed in, in the department uh, to drive small scale uh, manufacturing. We are also providing support uh, to township and rural based SMEs and cooperatives using the Spaza Shops Intervention Program Automotive Aftermarket because we know that in some of these sectors, 
most especially black owned businesses have not been part of this uh, sector so we are making sure that we grow these small businesses they start from being informal we formalize them we give them proper support so that they grow and become uh, serious players in the economic space we are also clear chair that we have this further bias towards uh, women-owned, youth-owned SMMEs and cooperatives and those that are owned uh, by, by persons uh, with disabilities. We are also making sure that uh, we implement um, a, a judgment um, on the case that was brought, brought against the, the, the president as well as the department on the criteria. And we are clear, Chair, that what we're going to be doing is to be is to implement the judgment and make sure that we are clear in terms of race, gender, youth, as well as uh, persons with disabilities. So, Chair, we will be very strong in terms of implementing uh, Triple B E uh, using uh, that particular uh, uh, judgment and all the resources that we have in the department. Chair, in terms of the performance uh, for the last uh, financial year, we are still working with the AG. There were some delays, um, and we are expected. Uh, to 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 ensure that at least by the end of this month we submit uh, uh, the, the the financial uh, report uh, to AG. But in terms of our performance, uh, the performance for the quarter four was 85 percent, and we could not uh, achieve 15 percent of the targets. And some of the reasons is because of the meetings that we were having, we had to shift. Uh, certain uh, uh, targets and not execute them and focus on responding or coming up with interventions that are responding uh, to the to the to the COVID uh, pandemic that we are facing. So we're preparing ourselves uh, to make sure that we launch uh, the schemes as soon as possible. Chair, I'll hand over. Let me, with your permission, hand over to the chief financial officer. She's part of the meeting just to take us through uh, from this uh, slide going forward. I thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, good morning, uh, Chairperson, with your permission. Please. Um, good morning, Chairperson. Good morning, Honorable Members. Good morning to our Minister. Good morning to the DG and the Chairpersons and the CEOs of the, uh, the two entities. Um, we were requested to come and provide the committee with and reasons why we, 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 we could not spend as planned for the fourth quarter. But we thought we should start, as had already been observed by the committee, that we had overspent in terms of cash flow by 13.4%. But equally so, we had underspent in terms of the set target by 15%. Um, with a slide that is projected, admin did not achieve one target. And in terms of the budget, admin underspent by 12.6%. In terms of the sector policy and research program, we had hoped to spend 7.8%. 9 million, we spent 5 million, and we underspent by 36.4. But in terms of targets, all the targets were reached for the, my apologies, that should be 100 on the underachieved instead of the 80%. Uh, integrated cooperatives development program only um, achieved 80% of the targets, which were 4 and 1%. Uh, uh, one target was not achieved, which equates to 20%. We had hoped to spend 35 million, but we over ex exceeded that. We, we overspent in terms of the cash flow and spent 57.4 million, which is a, an over uh, expending, uh, expenditure of 63%. And the last program, which is the Enterprise Development and Enter Entrepreneurship Program, we did not achieve two targets. We had hoped to spend 239. We exceeded the target of, or, or the cash that we had in a bank by 267 million, uh, sorry, by 11.5, by spending 267 million. In total, we, over, we overspent by 13.4%. So if you could please chair, uh, um, not chair, uh, my, my DG, 
reasons why did we underspend? The biggest item that underspend was the transfers and subsidies. We with that overspend was transfers and subsidies. We exceeded the budget by 58.4 million. And this is from a cash flow projection perspective, more than us exceeding the budget for the department, because we had for the first three quarters of the financial year uh, accumulated savings or surpluses that we had not spent of about 72 million that was that we utilized to offset the overspending items. Beef did not really overspend chairperson. We, in fact, when we reprioritized, as the 18 DG said earlier on, we did not have a line item for COVID-19 emergency fund. The only site or the only line that we had or that we could use to transfer money to CFAR after National Treasury's approval was this beef line. So we did not overspend in terms of the beef uh, program. So 85.3 was reprioritized from the various items that we have in the department. It, goods and services that, that were slow spending or underspending, we took 19 million from there. BBSDP that was also not uh, performing as planned in terms of the cash flow had about 60 million that we requested National Treasury to reprioritize for us to be able to um, shift the money through this beef line, transfer line to the emergency, COVID emergency fund. But we also had about 6.3 million that was meant for, that was a normal drawdown for beef that was not, that was received in December, but could only be processed in quarter four, hence the over exceeding of the cash that the cash that was available for beef purposes. Uh, the one program that underspent under our transfers is the Black Business Supplier Development Program, which underspent by 56.6 million. Um, I'm not so sure if the committee would know, but as a department, we had been, we had engaged the Office of the Auditor General to help us with a forensic investigation around anomalies that they had picked up during the regulatory audit. So those recommendations that came through required for us to introduce additional requirements or forced us to become more stringent in, in assessing the, 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 the applications that we received. So we had a very slow progress in processing claims that were CIS that were BBSDP related because some of the claims that we had received were not fully compliant, hence the slow spending in the two items, which was BBSDP initially. CIS was in the same category, but most of the CIS claims were able to, to, be, to, be, to be corrected to bring in the, the, the necessary documents that we required for us to be able to process. Hence, you notice the 24.8 million overspending that CIS had for the quarters. But um, I must stress once more that it's not overspending in terms of the budget. It was more the catch up with the cash flow surplus that we had. NIBAS, which is our national informal business upliftment strategy, but in, in terms of the budget, we call it scheme, also overperformed by 15.5 million and we utilized the, the, the surpluses from quarter two and quarter three to catch up. And we have what we call the Craft Customized Sector Program, which is that CCSP, which also overperformed by 4.7 million. And the reason it was that we, 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 we received the claims that were meant to have been received much earlier in the fourth quarter, hence the disbursements happened late. Um, CEDA underspent by 15 million because we had hoped to transfer the money in the fourth quarter, but they requested the money in quarter three. Hence, we had the money in our account, but we had used money that we had as a surplus in the bank account to give them the money in the uh, third quarter. Household transfers, which is mainly credit, uh, leave credits that we pay out to officials that leave departments, and we don't necessarily plan for it, also overperformed by 271. And we utilize money from goods and services to offset that. To the, in terms of compensation of employees, we do have vacancies in the department. We understand by 2.6. Goods and services, this was, or actually, um, I understand by 14.3 million, and mainly because we still had travel invoices 
there were venues that we still need, needed to pay for. But in the main, because we had revisited our APP with the advent of the new administration, most of the research programs that we had allocated the budget for would no longer be required, but hence the, 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 the underspending in the goods and services budget. Capital assets we had to buy in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, laptops for officials who ordinarily would have utilized CPUs, hence we exceeded the the, the, the cash flow for the quarter by 976. Um, I think I have covered, if, if it's all right with you, Chair. And that's why I will say thank you, Chairperson and the honorable members. Thank, thank, thank you. Um, honorable Minister, any, any addition from yourself? Uh, uh, thank you, Chairperson. What is becoming apparent to us is that when we do the engagements, we need to have a discussion on the recapitalization of CIFA, because in the main, CIFA continues to carry the largest of the applications for support for SMEs. And without its recapitalization or discussing the funding model of CIFA, we are going to continue to have um, expensive um, fund uh, finances to small businesses, because then CIFA tends to rely on interest charges and so forth. We are having a discussion with a, a national treasury, but also with the presidential uh, committee on SOEs, a presidential council on SOEs around the amalgamation or rationalization of CIFA and CIDA and saying what is the funding model, what becomes the business model, so that we mitigate that the cost to small businesses are not very high and fairly so. But those engagements are progressing and I hope we'll have another engagement with the Appropriations Committee before the next appropriations so that we can then uh, influence how th that re recapitalization takes place. The other issue I need to indicate on, on the issues that have been raised is that our engagement with the private sector is yielding much progress. But I think we are not very firm uh, collectively and including the parliament in terms of holding the private sector contribution to the development of the country. And I'll use an example around the BEE, uh, the triple BEE, uh, uh, why we suspended the program. We suspended the program because we feel if the engagement or how it's run currently is not beneficial. One large corporate come to us to say they want to do the equity replacement uh, with a, a replacement program, but they only want to spend 100 million. And in that 100 million, they want to advance their products. And we said, no, it's not acceptable. And we're engaging with the B commission around what should become the, the minimum that is prescribed for the private sector to contribute. And also there's a tendency that that which we require, for instance, the, the, the enterprise development, we require it for government, but not strongly for the private sector, although they've got licensing requirements that are there and will not place the economic recovery of this country on the correct footing if we, the private sector is not held to account and to contribute what they've promised to contribute when they are licensed to do so. Thank you, Chairperson. That's all I wanted to add. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Oral Minister, uh, Oral Members. Uh, let's let's see. Would like to engage with the presentation. Let's hear. Honorable Peters. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Joseph. Honorable Joseph. Matafa. Honorable Matafa. Mlenzana. Honorable Mlenzana. Tangwini. Honorable Tangwini. Kaiso. Honorable Kaiso. Um okay, let's uh, let's 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 go around Peters. Please take a first bite. Thank you very much, very Chairperson. Much, very much, very much. I don't know my sister. I don't know my sister. That's old. That's old. 
uh, other honorable members, please mute, please mute, please mute. Um, we, we have got four minutes, um, uh, honorable. Thank you very Thank much, you very Okay, um, Robert Peters, can, can I just ch try and see what happens? I was proposing that, that uh, the scene. Yes, yes, sir. yes, sir. Okay, can, can you please try and reconnect? I'll, I'll continue to Robert Joseph when you're available again. Let's see what happens. Okay, sure. thank you, Chairperson. Um, thank you uh, to the minister and the team. Uh, I find this department very interesting. I've, after 25 years of service in in city of Cape Town, I started my own business. I was 20 years with the bank. I couldn't get one cent from the bank, although I was 20 years with the bank. But it happened to turn out a good business um, afterwards. But I can understand what people are going through if you've gone through it yourself, how people are struggling um, to start with good ideas and business plans then the support is not there because the security for previously disadvantaged people is 100 times more. I don't know why, as if people are not trusted and then they can't make a contribution in the in the in the economy uh, and feeding their families and contribute towards the economy. So um, I want to say um, the point on on rural economy. The intervention is so critical that the ministers mentioned because we deal with urbanization and the youth and everyone is running to the cities who's looking for opportunities while we can invest in the rural economy uh, and, and, and could create a balance also in taking the pressure of urbanization, particularly the SMS is critical. I just want to ask the question um, to the minister, the senior acting positions it was uh, raised I'm sure the other members picked it up as long and the underspending of two million, uh, which I think contributes to maybe the acting people are not getting the same salaries, I'm sure. And But for how long are these senior people acting? Uh, I would like to know what is the problem there, why there is, there is continuous acting. And then the slide 17 or the fourth quarter, uh, Chairperson, a few departments are coming to us and talk about the fourth quarter. And actually, if one look at when COVID-19 started in March, but the critical decision was made by cabinet towards the end of March. So by the end of March, all departments should have almost been finished with the fourth quarterly spending that gives an overview of the whole year spending. So I'm not sure if departments are hiding behind the fourth COVID-19. It could start very late. I know Sasa and other departments were affected by the payments, but most of the departments should have been completed by the 26th of March on their fourth quarter expenditure. Um, then the last point, Chairperson, between that, that um, the cash flow and the over overspending, um, I, I, I assume there was priorities of money, because my question was where was this money going to come from, particularly the 58.4 million and the uh, as was said, 63% overspend. Um, I think the departments, uh, some departments, um, I don't assume a shifting of money, but I just want to know where, how did the department get this um, uh, or what can they do in future better to avoid that cash flow challenges that that um, the official referred to. Thank you, but thank you for the presentation and we need to support this department in the future of the country and the economy formal or informal is, is largely based on how we support this department. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you. Oral Peters, do you want to, to try? Thank, thank you, Chairperson. I, I think I fully agree with Honorable Joseph when, uh, Joseph when he says that we need to support this department because especially now uh, working towards post-COVID, we need to make sure that uh, even as the Appropriations Committee the, the committee can find a soft spot to land. I mean, the department, whenever they have serious challenges with regards to funding, if, if anything, this is the department that we need to fight for uh, uh, because many of our people are going to lose their jobs of, or have already lost their jobs. 
Many of them will try their hand in small business with the little packages that they have. So they need to really find a safe haven in the Department of Small Business. But also the Department of Small Business must move with the times and actually make it possible, a, a, a comrade minister, that uh, they can respond to the challenges, especially of those of our young people, as well as the women, because I would believe that uh, in this instance, we need to really make sure that we respond to the youth and respond to, 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 to women. Honorable Chaperson, uh, 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 I connected a little bit late in the presentation by the DG, and I had missed out on the minister's input in the initial stages. But I do have my questions. Uh, pardon me, minister, if I might raise some of the things that you would have uh, raised, but also, DG, some of the things that you might have raised. I, 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 I think the one thing that I need to indicate here, Chairperson, is that there seems to be a, a standstill in the CEDAR speeches, uh, the, the, the for, which is the springboard for SMMEs. And I think also taking into consideration the fact that now we are moving digital and we're working virtual, I suggest a minister that CEDAR should look at a digital resurgence of, of their, uh, their pitching uh, arrangement. But also the CEDA processes are still too paper or document centric and small businesses are at times struggling to source access to internet, let alone documents to be printed. I'll make this indication minister. In Kimberley, for example, I once went to PostNet and I saw a very long queue, and I, I, I checked from the people what they are queuing for because it looked almost like they are queuing for a, a voting. Then they said, no, they are here to print documents. They are here to try and get access to making it possible that they send a, a emails. And I, 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 I got worried because looking at the time that those people spend there, and business is actually time and money. So I would want to suggest that CEDA looks at their processes, make their process uh, uh, easier, especially for, 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 for small businesses of young people. I, 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 I am also suggesting, we have seen with the 350, how SASA has actually processed the applications with this USSD platform. And we have seen how the Department of Health with their COVID messages are also utilizing the USSD platform. And when you open that USSD platform, Minister, you realize that there are different government departments and uh, other entities that are using this option. It is not only in the net, uh, uh, mobile networks that they're using it. And I would recommend that the, 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 the CEDA also create that type of operational arrangement where it becomes data free and easy access for those, especially I'm, I'm speaking for, 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 for the youth in, in this inter instance. It will be a data free site and it will be accessible. There's also the need for peer mentoring where CEDA uh, 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 needs to create a platform where imagine a small business, especially young people can have mentors that or coaches that are attached to them. As, 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 as part of your support to the existing small businesses, encourage them to take along the imagined ones and to coach them. It will also reduce the over-reliance on CEDA, but also I'm, I'm, uh, uh, there's a need for, for small business to provide incentives. Honorable uh, Chaperson, in our upbringing, and I know the Honorable Minister uh, uh, might probably not remember some of these examples. In the townships, in the townships and rural uh, uh, environments, governments used to build shops where businesses would lease them from government. And, and I'm making this example, like for example, you have in your uh, Tabansu, in your Botsabelo, in your um, uh, 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 Mahike, in your uh, uh, many of 
uh, including in the Eastern Cape, as well as in 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 in, in Kuruman with Bumutibisat. There are shopping complexes there that are owned now by provincial entities, which just needs to be uh, 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 refurbished and leased out to this township and rural economic enterprises, so that their overheads for a, a rental should not be a deterrent for them to enter these particular spaces. And I would actually make an example, Minister, that the foreign-owned tax shops, they have actually identified this niche. They are leasing houses of South Africans to use as shops. And it is important that we can look at how this can also be used to, to support our uh, 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 this thing. The other thing, Minister, it is painful to see pick and pay, spa, and 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 bohulwets selling amagwenya. They are taking businesses from Abo Mama, who actually are responsible for some of us. Some of us grew up and went to university with Imali Amagwenya. And I would believe that there are women, there are young people who also saw, see these opportunities. But now, because of the competition with Woolworths, which has got available a flour and yeast and everything in the shop and labor, so their overheads are not a, 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 a that much, they would then make those fat cakes and, and, and go pick and pay. So it is also important to look at why we allow pick and pay and checkers to put up truck trucks as, as tax shops in the townships. That would actually work against your uh, objectives, your good intentions to revive the township economies because now they are open, they are closing the gap for those people in the townships whom we are trying through you to make it possible that they can enter this thing. But also, Minister, I would believe that the incentives that needs to be created Maybe a, a chairperson at another stage, in in uh, not during appropriation, we could get an opportunity to to talk to DTIC as well as a uh, small business jointly to see how we can be able to make it possible that the economy that we are talking about resuscitating. What is the incentives that they would to need to put in place? Because I would believe that in this day and era, Minister. With your small best, I mean your black industrial uh, 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 development program that DTIC that, is driving, you does. need to be the incubator minister. And without incentives, which Treasury would give you the necessary resources for, you are not going to be able to make sure that we can incubate this industrialist that we want to see emerging from our black community. Thank you very much. I'm sorry Thank again, Chairperson. No problem. Honorable Matapa. Thank, thank you very much, Chair. Uh, let me join other members in welcoming the presentation and uh, passing my greetings to, to the minister and the DG and the team as well. Now, uh, Comrade Chair, the Comrade Dipu has said a mouthful, so I'll just touch on those that he had, he had uh, not taken from my notes. The first one, is on the repurposing of funds towards COVID-19. Here, I'm interested to know um, this point coupled with um, the view that uh, there are measures that we think can be implemented, implemented in achieving the NTB, NDP targets of nine out of 10 new jobs uh, created by SMMEs. So the question there would be, what measures can be implemented so that this particular target, that nine out of 10 jobs will be created by SMMEs is still uh, realized. <clears throat> the second one, Chair, is uh, a question that I would have wanted to import from the discussion that we had now with the basic education in terms of small contractors and emerging contractors who are unable to meet the legislated requirements and I think Comrade Peters speaks very well in terms of peer monitoring as well as uh, peer mentoring as well as uh, incubation programs. So the question there should be direct to say what measures are there from the department that will ensure 
that these small and emerging contractors do not remain in that space, but equally grow and develop to being able to compete on equal footing with those that are already developed. Uh, considering that most of the works in local economic development would revolve around manufacturing and construction. Lastly, Chair, it's, it's, this one is just a high level question. Does the department have a view or a sense of how much SMMEs contribute to the GDP of the country? And secondly, is the department happy with that particular rate of contribution? And uh, if not, what would be ideal as a target for the department to put as what they would prefer SMMEs to contribute to the GDP of the country? Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you, Roman. Roman Lenzana. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you so much, uh, Chairperson. Let me also join uh, my colleagues uh, in uh, one greeting the, the minister and also uh, passing words of condolences and uh, also appreciating the presentation. Chair, okay, some of uh, my notes have been somehow tackled, but then, if for instance, this also with me, like Honorable Matafa, it's a high level question, Honorable Minister. If you can talk to us on economic recovery through informal economy, I'm deliberately generic. Uh, Chair, let me also appreciate uh, the endeavors by the ministry in terms of driving localization. However, one would want to know more, Honorable Minister. On your, do you have a tool for the impact assessment as to what is it that you are talking nationally is actually prevailing at that local level? I, I'm, I'm raising this, uh, Honorable Minister, with a question, for instance, do you have a database and performance history of cooperatives in particular and uh, the small businesses in general? Chairperson, there is this flying allegation that uh, the department officials, whether in development agencies or in the various departments, would uh, immediately, there is, like now we're talking COVID-19, they would jump into creating their own cooperatives for their personal interests to, to the disadvantage of the already existing uh, small businesses and cooperatives. Now, uh, for, for instance, Honorable Minister, I, I have a particular detail which I can provide outside this session, where you would have a particular co-op established as far back as 2006, funded then by tourism, funded by social development 2008, and then there was a null till 2013, where they got only the sign board, which was done. Uh, and then as we speak now, there's nothing. Uh, Remember that one, it's a craft center for women and uh, people with disabilities. It's now crumbling. But as I'm saying, I can, I, I can offer details, uh, Chairperson, after, after, after the meeting and, uh, you know, in the sidelines. Chair, my last question then would be, no, it's the second last, Chair. What is the department doing to assist these MMEs and co-ops in dealing with these delayed payments by the departments and uh, entities, because they're suffering. This delay where departments do not honor the 30 days cycle in terms of payments. And then my last question, Chair, would be, it was charged somehow by Honorable Matava. You know, I'm more interested on the Black Business Supply Development Program, which uh, is listed amongst those where the, the expenditure trends uh, are not very good. What is the root cause of uh, the slow disbursement and implementation of these programs that are geared towards assisting cooperatives and SMMEs 
to scale up their operations. Thanks, Chairperson. I will come back if there is another bite because there are some questions, but for now I'm fine. Thank you, Orabul Mlenzana. Orabul Tangwini. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, let me just join um, my colleagues in thanking the department for the presentation and also to echo um, um, to, to what um, honor, uh, the other honorable members have said on the key um, responsibility of the department and also um, how important and vital this department is to the country's economy. And in, in, in that uh, sense, uh, Chair, let me also uh, state on, I think honorable, the honorable member of the DA raised it on the cash flow issues. It seems seemingly we're going to have through all of these departments that are coming to the Appropriations Committee Chair, with the underspending and overspending, it will everything is now just covered. And to avoid that, because on appropriations you account for the rents and cents that you are spending. So in order for us to track properly that this overspending and underspending is really because of COVID, I think departments should give us a spreadsheet or layout with the amount of cost where they have put on overspending and what was exactly the the reasons thereof of the overspending in in in, in some of the programs because now for departments to just come to us with blanket approach it's covert is covert is covert and we really don't know did this money really goes to the correct people that it um should have gone to and so forth, or was used for the correct intent that it was 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 meant to. So I really think we need to look into the the approach of these departments departments coming to appropriation, and just saying to us that everything um, it's it's because of COVID. I think that uh, uh, um, it's creating such a, a wrong culture in accounting for four monies and, and and the department needs to take an active role in on also addressing the underspending especially sometimes when the underspending of the uh, uh, savings because mm -hmm. what departments these days are doing a chair they are coming to us and say we have done a saving on a vacant post how can a, a vacant position be a saving if it's already budgeted for and we have approve and those uh, positions were funded. So that is also one of the aspects we need to look in chair. And then um, on, on this department, on the emergency relief funding uh, chair, um, can we have a list of companies that have received uh, this uh, um, emergency funding, uh, relief funding chair, and also the sectors thereof? If the department don't have it now, they can uh, give us to us in writing and then we are um, more than happy to also see that there is a fair flow of monies or relief that are going to the certain companies. And then on the second last one, Chair, because what we have also found, found that in some of the com instances of companies, they take a relief from, from government and then, then two or three weeks down the line or two months down the line, they go and close or retrench people. We need to also find work hand in hand. If you are taking an emergency relief fund from 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 government, that also there are at your uh, it doesn't have implications on on people losing their jobs tomorrow. Because equally so, this department is also go hand in hand in job creation and also uh, in 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 line with supporting small business. Then also chair on the suspension on the. Township Entrepreneur Fund Chair. What is the plans of the department to have this address in, especially in in in, in township uh, businesses that are in uh, that will face and they were faced with in inequalities, Chair. So what is the department going to do since this process or this part of the funding was suspended? Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, thank you, Orabul Kaiso. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Chair. I 
seem not to have many issues to say other than uh, firstly express also my condolences to the uh, minister. Uh, <clears throat> so I've got only uh, this to say here, uh, commend the work that has been done by the ministry, uh, of course, over a long period. We have, that's what we have been expecting to see in terms of roll out to uh, to develop the people's economy at the at the township level and we see this as a platform for many of our uh, emerging uh, small entrepreneurs uh, uh, business people being able to found their footing in terms of reviving the township economy uh, now i i think the the issue that I want to raise here is on the employers not uh, registering for UIF. I think one year would say, I think it's important that the Department of uh, Small Business has to work very close with the SARS and the Department of Labor uh, because we have a high number of unemployed uh, people Therefore, some are hiding uh, and make it difficult for, for the small business to can actually dispense what is supposed to happen in terms of their mandate because of these unscrupulous uh, employers who do not register uh, their employers for UIF. Therefore, I think it will be important that uh, there has to be a collaboration with the South, Reserve, uh, South African Reserve as, uh, Revenue Services and Department of Labor to track down this anomaly. <clears throat> and uh, one uh, last point, it was just really to appreciate the, the issue of amalgamation. Uh, of course, the president did say that uh, there has to be a way to, you know, uh, review the role of the state-owned own enterprise you know, to, to maximize its uh, uh, <clears throat> role in as far as development of the economy is concerned. Therefore, that council or that recapitalization uh, thing should happen. And we fully behind as a, as a committee, behind the small business uh, development uh, department. So we must give it a support. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, honorable members uh, from, from my side. Uh, welcome the the, the 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 presentation from the minister and uh, her team. Let me start by agreeing with the minister that uh, there is so much incongruency between the expected outcomes of the department and the resources which are made available. And I'll I'll tell you, minister, that uh, <clears throat> this seems to be um, uh, <clears throat> a story of our lives, even with other. Uh, uh, DFIs, which are supposed to deal with the SMMEs and the funding of, of, of black companies. I think it's something that as, as, as a committee we really must persist with um, giving 2 billion rand uh, to, the, to the national department, which must take care of, small, of all small businesses in the country. I think uh, we, it's, we are expecting too much from it. So there is definitely a need for for more resources for for this for this department, I just want to check with the uh, the the minister. What has been your experience, for instance, if there is one, with our interaction with provi provincial development institutions, uh, your Free State Development Corporation, your Lim Devs, your Itala, and so on? Is there an interaction, and what exactly comes out of of that inter interaction? <clears throat> I, I agree. I, I think again, it's a uh, uh, <clears throat> the point that I've made, and you would have seen uh, oral members when we dealt with the, the land bank that uh, there is such a big need to recapitalize those institutions which must focus on black business. We must walk. We must walk the talk as as government as far as it is concerned. Uh, for instance, one of the things which was raised by the land bank, which is being raised. Uh, by uh, small business development today. It's uh, the, the cost of funding for small businesses. Small businesses should be having what you call a discriminatory discriminatory funding. That is, there should be some uh, 
consideration of as far as the cost of capital that they get. But as uh, Honorable Joseph was saying, that small businesses, emerging businesses, black businesses, they end up having to pay more than your established businesses as far as the cost of capital is concerned, uh, because they'll be said to be too risky and so on and so forth. So that's uh, uh, what we call market failure. And as government, that's why we should be, be coming, coming in uh, to assist. Otherwise, we'll be singing this song of small businesses having to play this role and so on and so forth, black businesses having to play this role, this role. Uh, but without the resources, uh, it, it, it remains just a song. So I think, honorable members, uh, it's a challenge to us so that we can, uh, uh, in our interaction with National Treasure, that can they please uh, uh, fund uh, inclusive growth? Because as things are, uh, definitely there isn't much that is happening. Honorable Minister, you would have listened to our debates even before talking about this 200 billion rents, uh, this facility of National Treasury and uh, and the South African Reserve Bank. Uh, our first problem was that this money is not being, um, it has not been assessed uh, uh, by, accessed by uh, small businesses, by black businesses. That was one. Two, again, uh, it was seen to be very much urban based. Uh, the rural areas have got no uh, <clears throat> chance of accessing uh, this money. Again, the, the B companies, it will be very difficult for them especially those who are not around here. Um, I think the first, the last time we debated, only about 5% of this money had, had been used and with all types of economic problems uh, which come with it. So I just want to check, you said you are interacting with, uh, with National Treasury. What is the progress? What are, what, what are they saying? Because in our, in our discussion, in our debate, when it came, it came to this, we're saying even this, uh, provincial developmental institutions must also have access to this money. And uh, to also latch on to what Honorable Tangin was saying, that businesses which are being assisted by government, uh, there should be some under, it can't just be a blank check. There should be a, 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 some conditionality that will attach to that money. It's people's money, they can't just have access to it, these hundreds of billions of rands, but to find that uh, they go out and the following day they're retrenching workers. So the types of conditionality that you, you, you would like to see taking place. There is, there is an, the public procurement bill, uh, honorable minister. What's your take on the bill? Do you think it's starting to deal with uh, your challenges? Uh, for instance, you were saying uh, we must hold responsible the private, private sector. For me, one way of holding responsible the private sector is that when you procure goods and services from government, it must have dealt with some of the things that you are raising. So, but I'm just checking whether you have been, uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, you and your team looked at the public procurement bill and do you think that it is addressing the things that you are raising? Honorable Minister, uh, the time it's, it's uh, five, about five minutes past 12. Uh, let's, you can, you can go until 25 past. Thank you with your responses. You are at your hands. Minister, thank you, Chairperson, and thank you to the honourable members for the questions, but uh, also thank you for the commitment to support us with the future appropriations, and we are available to have uh, detailed engagements with the committee in terms of the areas where, of, where we think you may need clarity or where you need clarity and where you need, where you need to guide us so that when you uh, go fight for our... Um, uh, better uh, appropriation, we, you, you are fully empowered in terms of the work that we are doing. Uh, Honorable Peters raised important issues around the use of technology. We've started to use technology. We've done the SMMESA database. It's not yet at uh, SSD feature. We are going to move to SSD feature. But that um, SMMESA a database allow us to also integrate our back office to minimize the separation of CEDA, CIFA, and the department. So we are working at the back end to make sure that everything else can be done online. Currently, the applications on all the informal and micro business schemes that have been announced are done online. 
the SPASA was not the SPASA support scheme was not done online, but now it's ready to be done online. We are moving towards that. We are also starting to process online, and we we will come and share with the committee the significance of that SMME as a, a, a database or platform in terms of enabling SMMEs not only as our way of knowing how many are they, but all, also for them to participate even in the global value chains through that uh, through that platform. Because we are already talking integration with the EU platform with the International Trade Center platform, with the Africa Medical Supplies platform, and many other platforms, but also talking with other big corporates in terms of linkage with their own platforms, and also creating or from it a trade exchange. So we are working on that. And we, the, the virtual pitching, we, CEDA is already working on how do we make sure we can allow for virtual pitching so that the pitch for funding, which we had uh, improved from pitch and perfect, is can continue across the country, but without disadvantaging the rural provinces. And our focus or prioritization of women, youth, and people with disabilities is not negotiable. In, in youth in particular, the governing party has set us a target for 20%. Our target is 30% support to youth-owned enterprises. We may not have met it initially, but we are, we are pushing it aggressively so. We are also uh, debating the 40% vis-a-vis the 50% support to women-owned enterprises. And also because of the court judgment, we are debating the percentage for race and we, because we are required by court to specify the, the percentage that we do for, for black people because the redress, the court acknowledged that redress in terms of race has not been done in our country. And currently we are working on a 70% possibility because if you look across if you go to business partners, one of uh, the entities where we've got shareholding, they fund 30% black and 70% white. You go to the banks, even if you use the National Credit Guarantee as an example, the majority of those who benefited, more than 70% is white, but less, less than that. And government must stand in to address the market failure, and we are committed to, to do that. Uh, Honorable uh, Peters also referred to to the shops that I may not remember. I know she was saying I may not. <laughs> it may have been before my time. Uh, we, we, we are working with the DTIC first on the industry, revitalization of their industrial parks and making them available for small businesses. But we are also, the CIFA also has a very strong portfolio across the country of, 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 of uh, properties that they wanted to dispose of. And we said it can't be disposed of we must repurpose them for the use by small businesses. So last year, CIFA, the board of CIFA and the executive team have gone around the country to do the assessments. Unfortunately, they could not complete the assessments because the COVID, the lockdown came, but we are going to finalize that and make sure that that infrastructure remains available. But we are also working on what we call the shared infrastructure program on our part. That shared infrastructure program says, how do we support small businesses to own properties or facilities together without necessarily carrying the same burden. I'll use the example of uh, the fashion industry. Your young, uh, um, emporia, young Emporium Designs, what we are doing now, we are saying in terms of the clothing, textile and leather strategy, we are creating what we call Mzanzi fashion or Ekasi fashion. And we are getting all these people who make garments and whatever, grouping together per district and say, can we, rent a shop for them in a mall or can we provide a facility for them that they can, their, their products can be sold there. We are going to share with you the details of that shared infrastructure program. It includes things for the markets, uh, the, the food and veg markets and so forth. So we are working on that. We'll, we'll share the details of that program because we believe that if government does not inter intervene, our people will continue not to make an impact in the economy. There was a question also that was raised um, we can't stop the Woolies and everybody from selling Maguinya, but we've got a scheme to support informal and micro restaurants, chisamyamas, ekas, takeaways, to make sure that they can compete strongly with Woolies, including packaging, and make them available as takeaways in a way that is presentable with that. And we agree with you. We are not going to leave a pick and pay and shop right to open spaza shops in our township. We are already working with Salga. And uh, in terms of making sure that part has stopped, we, we took a decision also as government. CIFA was partnering with Pick and Pay, and we've stopped them from that partnership because we think that that informal businesses must be left for the most ordinary of people who do not have 
the sunk in cost to invest in big business because the participation of these big um, uh, 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 retailers in the market makes that low entry business to be very expensive. The Spaza shop of pick and pay, for instance, cost 300 million, whereas me and you know that you can start a Spaza shop with as near as 1,000 rand. So we, are, we, we have made that intervention. There was also a question around how do we in incubate the black industrialists. Our um, industrial uh, localization program or industrial development program that the DG mentioned too, it's about that incubation that we want to provide and we'll come and share the details with the committee because we think it needs more funding. We are funding it through blended finance. We want to fund it from the National Credit Guarantee Scheme participation, but we think we need more money for that scheme because it will go a long way. We'll share the details later. In terms of acting positions, I think what is important is not how long people have been acting, is what are we doing to address the acting position. The position of DG has closed. We are already, uh, Honorable Josephs, we are already filling that position. Uh, the, the, uh, we are working with uh, DPSA to complete the, the recruitment of the DG of the department. The position of the acting C of the CF CEO of CIFA, we are also, the, the interviews have been done. We are doing the necessary approval processes in terms of the governance that is required. So they should be filled in shortly. And the CEDA acting position only became vacant. It's not vacant. The CEO was is suspended and the board is completing that process. So, and that suspension was done in... In March, uh, yeah, in April this year, and we have uh, urged the board to complete the process as speedily as possible, so that either the CEO can resume her duties, or if she can't resume her duties, we can complete the process of filling the position. But the filling of those position uh, of the position of CEDA, if the CEO cannot resume her position in terms of the board process, which I'm not yet fully briefed in terms of what are the outcomes thereof we will have to be dependent also on the measure that we have re referred to. And there's the issue of whether departments are using scapegoats around COVID-19. We need to clarify that COVID-19 started to hit China in November 2019, and in December 10, 2019, China was already working on lockdown. Majority of uh, 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 trade in, uh, with South Africa and China was affected by that. So as government, as early as January, we started to have discussion of what are the plans that we need to put in place in case what was happening in China becomes a global pandemic? At that point, you will know that China had already closed down tourism and travel and a whole lot of things. So the economy was already impacted as early as January and February. So the reprioritization, when we took a decision to say, let's slow down, we're saying, let's slow down so that we can have a response if this thing reaches faster. So it's not an excuse, but the reality is that this thing was with us already in November. And they, it's just that when we took a decision, that's why when we took a decision, you, are, you will be aware that the Department of Small Business Department, uh, Development was the first one to announce the relief schemes before any other department because we were already ready with our plans to support small businesses during those, those periods. And we agree on how do we, that there must be an improvement on cash flow management, but the, uh, the DG and the team will respond to that, uh, to, to the, to that part. And um, Honorable Matafa, ask questions, what are the measures we are doing to make sure that we, we safeguard the job creation targets? That's why we took a decision that we are going to reprioritize the township and rural enterprise entrepreneurship program because we believe majority of our people where they reside, they can start businesses at informal and micro level and then create jobs. In those schemes, all of all of the, the schemes that we're talking about, we can tell you the number of jobs that we, we are already present, we preserving or uh, safeguarding or creating new ones. We'll submit to the committee just for detail, for instance, on the SPASA support to say, with the SPASA that we've already supported, how many jobs were we able to preserve with that so that you can see that we are chasing the target of creating jobs. The issue, uh, I'm privileged, Honorable Matafa, that I sat in, in the discussion with the Department of Basic Education when they're explaining the exclusion of small contractor and emerging contractors. There's a tendency by officials to put requirements in their bids to make sure that they exclude small contractors and emerging contractors. Part of our responsibility as a department when we deal with the, both the public procurement bill and also deal with the localization is a specification that says we are no longer negotiating a 30% requirement in the bids. We are saying this type of job must be reserved and preserved for the local people. And local cannot be South Africa. 
in the Eastern Cape, local must be that province or that region in particular, because there are things that the regions can do. You see when we submit our our support for on the township and, inter, and rural entrepreneurship program, we detail the numbers, not a, a global number, the number per province, but by a number per individual district that we, are, we want to support in that area to ensure the spread, because we must all, and that's the demand that the district-based development model requires. We are saying also with the infrastructure development program, which we are a member of the Interministerial Committee, we have agreed with Minister Dilil that the infrastructure programs of government, they must have clear targets and clear reservations for local uh, uh, contractors and emerging contractors, not at a percentage level, but reserve particular jobs for them because those skills are available in that area. And officials will stop putting requirements that excludes um, uh, people. The GDP contribution for SMMEs before COVID, we were at sitting at between 24 and 35 percent, depending on sector. But the target for NDP says we must contribute 70 percent to the GDP as small businesses by 2030. We are going to have an engagement at cabinet level in terms of whether that is still feasible or if it's feasible, what are the support requirements that we, we, we require to do. Honorable Mulenzani asked us uh, to say, the economic recovery, why are we focusing the economic recovery on the informal businesses? We've learned from Eastern Europe that informal businesses are the major drivers of the economy. Even in the country, when it's estimated that 2.4 million uh, businesses are small businesses, 1.4 million of that business are informal businesses. And they therefore play a largest contribution. And that's why we've got dedicated schemes to support informal businesses. And we're not only supporting them for in, in, in for as informal businesses, we are moving so that we can account for those businesses in the economy. That's why we are requiring them to register with us, not only requiring them, but supporting them to register with us, supporting them to register their employees with UIF. Because the requirement of UIF and SARS, it doesn't mean that when they are registered, they are paying tax, they are exempted, and we are working with the uh, commissioner of SARS and both, and the commissioner of UIF. Because even in UIF, the 10 rent contribution per employee per month is, is sufficient to make sure that employee is protected in case there's future loss of employment. But also in such, they're exempted from paying tax, but they're registered and they can be accounted for. It also helps us in terms of fighting for budget because National Treasury will know the numbers that we are chasing or the impact in the economy that we are chasing. We don't have a database for, for cooperatives or small businesses we've supported in the past. We are now through the SMMESA, we are now creating and uh, recreating that record and tracing their support. For instance, when we do the schemes that we support in cooperatives, our argument of small, supporting small businesses to revitalize, we are saying the investment that government has made in the past must be recouped. So we cannot start with new ones. We must also go and reinvest in those we supported before who are either struggling, but we must make sure that they succeed. That's why our interventions are not once off. They are a 24 months to 36 months intervention, and that's why we, we continue to, to support them. And we are hoping that the, the work that National Treasury is doing and the DPSA, in terms of tracing the participation of government officials, they are not limited to the department and agencies, is across into the, it, 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 as, it, as businesses, as business entrepreneurs also in government or supported by government can be stemmed, and we, we cooperate with the DPSA and National Treasury in that space on our part. The DG will deal with the poor performance of, black, of the Black Business Supply Program, but what we have done, we, we are no longer continuing with that. We, are, we have improved it, and we are hoping the improved program of industrialization will, in, will, will enhance the participation because we, we at the performance, because we, we are also strongly partnering with the private sector or the banking sector to make sure that the, 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 the speed and efficiency is, is much better. Uh, Honorable Sanguini, we will we'll provide the list of companies uh, per sectors that you, you require for those who have benefited. And to deal with the issue that you, the concern that you raised, that how do we make sure that those who have benefited do not go then turn around and, and retrench? You will see when we report on the disbursements of the approvals we have done, the disbursements and approvals are not the same. It's because we are doing monthly disbursements. And you must give us a, a evidence that the people you are saying you are going to pay their salaries or you're going to pay whatever, your business is still uh, 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 operating because we can't pay for you 
when you your business has shut down because people have that tendency. And similarly, we've got uh, the same advice to the UIF to say do it the same, and that's why they're doing. They've done monthly disbursements also to make sure that you don't pay for people who are no longer employed, but the money resides in the in, on the money of the of the business owners. You are concerned about the. The, the 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 suspension or the uh, the the, the uh, redirection of money from the township entrepreneurship fund we have reprioritized the township and rural entrepreneurship program to close that gap and that's where that's that's how we are not worried about it ourselves because that's why the schemes we've been talking about including our localization program and industrial program they deal with the township and and and, and rural enterprise uh, entrepreneurship program i've dealt with the questions that Honorable Kaiso had raised around URF and, and SARS. We've had flag of, and criticism from people who are saying, why do you require them to be registered? And I've clarified that we are requiring them to be registered because we want to protect also their workers, but we also want to account for them. But we also want them to be better funded in the future. It's only if they can be accounted for that they can be funded in the future and supported in the future. It took us unnecessary two months to negotiate with the URF for them to extend funding for the test to the ones who had not registered, SMMEs who had not registered employees. If we did not succeed in that in that negotiation, it would have meant majority of SMMEs did not benefit from UIF. But we are working closely with them, both the commissioners of SARS and UIF and the department and the minister of um, labor in terms of registration and their continued participation and support. Chairperson, I want to, 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 to expressly indicate our sincere, most sincere uh, appreciation for the commitment you have made as a committee to support us. On our part, we've, we started to work with the, we created a MINMEC. You'll be aware since the establishment of the department in 2014, there was not a MINMEC of the Department of Small De uh, Business Development, but this year we created a MINMEC, uh, which includes myself and the Deputy Minister, and the MEC is responsible for economic development in the provinces because we have all realized that economic development in the provinces is not driven by the mandate of DTIC, but, the, but by the mandate of the Department of Small Business Development. In that minimum, we collaborate on a number of things. These schemes that we talk about, the, uh, the provincial uh, departments are actively supporting us to either top up where there are gaps, because we say, I'll use an example of KZN. KZN, we've said we are going to support over, I think, over 2,500 puzzle shops from KZN. And KZN says, no, they can top up so that it can reach almost uh, 3,500. So that, those the collaboration we do. And they top up using also their own agencies. We are not yet fully there in terms of the integration of work, but we are very happy with the integration and cooperation of uh, Lipopo, Northwest, KZN, Free State in particular. They have come to the party in terms of collaborating with the department and even where there are gaps in terms of performance, there's been a serious improvement, including during the time when we needed to work with call centers. They availed their own call center capacity, some of them using their agencies. And we are hoping that the other four provinces will also come to the party as they clarify their issues. I must raise our concern, though, with the collaboration with the Western Cape province. It's very minimal. And they they they, are, they tend to frustrate the work that has been done, and that if, if, by the department. And we are we are uh, we have engaged at cabinet level and other uh, levels to make sure that there can be a collaborative approach, including the Western Cape, because they don't remain, they are not a federal depart, uh, department. You have raised an issue of the the cost of capital for small businesses, also the onerous credit profiling of small and micro enterprises by banks. So that's why our schemes for informal and micro enterprises, we are partnering with the banks and saying as a requirement, we must, government must use whatever is the investment to create a credit profile for these micro and informal businesses so that they can qualify for lending or credit uh, facilities of the banks. Similarly, on the National Credit Guarantee Scheme, we, our approach is that we want to deal with the market failure. So our intervention is to clearly support black businesses women-owned and youth-owned businesses. Also, the president has said we must insist on that the National Credit Guarantee Scheme must also fund the informal and micro businesses because they are the bulk of the businesses and those are the ones they are, we are funding. The conditionalities that the banks have put in, we have said is not, uh, is, not, uh, is not helpful because they wanted a credit profile and they wanted to service only their clients. That's why we intervened with National Treasury 
and there is significant progress. We are hoping that in the next couple of weeks, there should be a decision in terms of our participation. We want to participate, participate through the Kulan and uh, Credit Guarantee Scheme that we already have and will partner with the banks because we think that if we use the Kula Credit Guarantee Scheme, there will be better traction even on SMMEs. Our views on public procurement bill is a good start. We are making uh, submissions in terms of uh, the issues there, but our issues that to the public procurement bill must not only talk about percentages. We are saying certain goods and services must be strictly reserved for SMEs and small businesses. And if you, because if you talk percentages of saying 30%, officials have ways of working around that. But our argument is that if you say uh, uniform of police and uniform of the soldiers, must be procured only from small businesses and cooperatives. Then, then you don't have a debate of whether it's a big business or whatever. It's small business. It doesn't matter who it goes to. It should be a small business, and you can hold officials accountable for. We are arguing, for instance, why should bread in the feeding schemes of government, both the, the Department of Health in hospitals, schools, social development in, in, in food puzzles, why should that bread not be procured from the bakeries that are owned by small businesses and cooperatives, for, for instance? So that's the move that we are doing. We'll share with yourself our comprehensive submission to on the uh, public procurement bill uh, in terms of what we think it should be the way forward. And Chairperson, thank you. I'll invite the, the Chairperson of CIFA to add if there's outstanding things and the DG to clarify the few things that I've left out. Thank you. The Honourable Minister, the time is time is up. Extra time, injury time. Uh, okay, let's 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 hear. One minute, one minute. DG. Yes. Th thank you, Chair. Uh, I think I'll clarify one one thing. Is around PPSDP. Uh, I think there was a question around expenditure on PPSDP. There, Chair, we had to choose. Um, we, there was an audit that was done by uh, AG, and they came up with some findings, and we had to strengthen some internal control measures or to institute new internal control measures. So there were some delays because we had to check, for example, the connectedness of businesses, because some business people, what they will do, they will establish a number of enterprises and so they will be benefiting uh, twice uh, from the same scheme. So we had to institute those. And then if you have to uh, make sure that these people are not uh, bypassing the system, you have to go to CIPC, go to CSD, also interact with SARS, uh, also to prevent government employees from benefiting from our schemes. We also had to interact uh, with DPSA to check uh, PESA. So we had to delay processing uh, payments for some of the of the fund of the approved project. That's why there were some delays. So we had to choose to save the taxpayers' money than to fund wrong enterprises. But we are working on ensuring that these internal controls don't delay funding or support to SMEs. Chair, the, I think that's the only question the minister did not uh, respond. Um, one more person, the CEO of CIFA. Uh, good morning, Chair. I think the, 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 the minister was referring to, to, she asked that I make an input. My name is Martin Mouse, Chairperson of the um, I think the minister has adequately covered the, the areas, except to say there was a question that was raised on um, how do we measure impact. Uh, in our reports, Chair, we've got a balance scorecard that we report on development impact on basically the core areas in terms of uh, the policy of government, particularly in relation to uh, the advancement of, uh, of uh, funding to, to the designated categories in terms of uh, our demographics, uh, be it on race, be it on, on gender, be it on disabilities. We also report uh, consistently on uh, our penetration as far as the, the impact that we make in, in townships and uh, in rural economies. So I wouldn't want to, 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 uh, to I, I, I uh, dearly appreciate the fact that the time is limited. We can provide that and that information is readily accessible in terms of our reports 
read our quarterly reports that we submit to the portfolio committee and, and the department. Uh, but also we can advance, as, as I indicate now, the, the latest test indication in terms of how our reports, our performance has been over the, the, the past uh, financial year and also the latest uh, consolidated report. We can arrange that and make a, a submission accordingly. Thank you very much. Honorable uh, Member, thank you very much, Honorable uh, uh, Minister, with, with, with your team. Um, I, I think a, a, a lot of things were discussed, but again, in the same breath, a lot of things can still be discussed. Um, this is just the beginning of a process. It's not, it's not an event we'd like to engage with you on a continuous basis because, yes, we agree with you that it's a, it's a sector when we talk about inclusive growth. If we don't do it here, there's nowhere else we can do it. Um, so it's, it's very important that on an ongoing basis we do engage. Honorable Clara, uh, please uh, uh, <clears throat> don't don't hit me. Honorable Clara, she was saying I should be careful. I may be discriminating against Limpopo. I'm 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 I'm, I'm not. Will I'll I'll, I'll, I'll I'll will catch up next time. But honorable members, uh, Minister, and, and, and Jefferson, the, Jefferson, yeah. please act like the the real pastors who will always talk the truth. I did not say that, Joan. You know, you know. I said you did not notice that I raised my hand. <laughs> it's okay. I, I I don't have a problem, Chair. I'll ask next time. Thank that's, you. That's 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 fine. Um, Remember, this brings us to the end of 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 the meeting. We want to deal with the the other item. We'll we'll take it in our next meeting. But thank you very much. Uh, the meeting stands adjourned. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank, you thank, you. thank you very much. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you. Thanks, 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 Chairperson. Thank you, thank you, thank you, guys. Honorable Dikale, Utlakopanali Minister Atile. Utlakopanatile, Yalimpopo. Hi, Nodiodo. Hi, Jefferson. Okay, how are you? Hi, hi, hi Babado. <laughs> Hello, Babado. How are you? Yeah, I'm more at <laughs> Okay, that's fine. Are you Jefferson? Good? Yes. Please, Please don't carry. forget about that uh, that invitation. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, I was still putting my mind around it. Thank you. Okay. We also need to arrange a main call as soon as possible. Okay. Let's talk and about that. There's an urgent thing. No, not here. Not here. I'll call yeah, yeah. you. Yeah, yeah. All yeah, right, yeah. Chair. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Good afternoon. Yes,